but the closed caption says rapid squelching. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Sincast, presented by CinemaSins. All right, everybody, welcome to the Sincast. This is Chris Atkinson from CinemaSins, joined as always by the voice of CinemaSins, Jeremy Scott. Sup? Mm-hmm. Sup? Sup with the whack sup whackness? Mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Have you ever seen The Wackness? No, is it a movie? Yeah. Uh, it's another one of those that I think has gotten some some like uh, extra like, oh, this movie was a lot better than you thought it was. Uh, but it was like Olivia Thurlby was in it. and uh, ah. I can't remember who else was in it, actually. I don't remember anything about the movie. Let's move on. <laughs> no, <laughs> it, no, it was. I, I, I want to see it again because I haven't seen it in forever. Um and for music video since Barrett share. Hey yo, I tell you what I want to see mm. is after reading some of that best movie year ever is The Wood and uh The Best Man. Yeah. Because I got those so confused and they talk about it in They're that book. Almost the same movie. It's it's it very similar. Tay Diggs is the star in both of them. Mm-hmm. But like there is one that's very more indie and there's one that's very more like you know studio yeah produced. i think the best man is the big studio one. yeah the wood is the more indie one and i can't remember i think i saw the best man i don't I think saw i saw the wood though yeah 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 it's it's a bunch of guys getting back together because uh, in each of them was the wood the one that had in the trailer that back in the day when i was young and not a kid anymore some days I wish that I could I be a kid again. Yeah. Back in the day. well there's my little trailer that, that for did, you. did that song exist back in 1999 I don't know. I feel like the trailer for a Tate Diggs movie had that song in it. Mm. And it was like, is the wood a period piece? Is it set? Mm-mm. Yeah, it's set in 1999. Oh, well, I don't fucking know. I guess I'll Google it when I get home. Oh, yeah. no. Well, it's no, it goes between 1986 and 1999. Yeah, it's one. Of, yeah. So, one yeah, of, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'll well, look it up. I'm either going to be stupid or smart. <laughs> and I've been both. I kind of I <clears throat> want to see now. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just find a trailer for the wood. I'm, I'm finding it. Uh, okay, he's doing it. I'm already doing it. I will if you let me. <laughs> you should read that book, by the way. I, I would love to it. read that book. I was thinking the other day, speaking of Tay Diggs being in two identical movies, about how many how many movies Denzel has been in where he plays a law enforcement person who's also being investigated by some about something. And Jeez. there's at least three or four. I inside man, obviously. And taking a Pelham one, two, three. Philadelphia is he being investigated? Uh, I know well, he's a he's lawyer, a lawyer. But... Um, but then there's also the one in like the Caribbean where he's like trying to cover up for his buddy's murder before he gets yada yada. And then in uh, Deja Vu, I think there's some kind of previous investigation yeah. about his. Uh... Yeah. Anyway, I think there are a lot of Denzel movies where he's a law enforcement agent who's also recently been investigated that movie you're talking about, by the way, uh, Jonathan and I uh, reviewed for a now defunct podcast uh what was that called um the mighty quinn the mighty oh, quinn yeah yeah, yeah. Oh. uh but uh yeah i'm i'm looking up the wood trailer right now and boom i feel good Almost every time you say something like this, I generally think that you're probably right. Because it's too specific. There's no way you're wrong. Who would claim to be that yeah. who was not? Right. Oh, Man, shit. Jesus. Uh, nice. Anyway, <laughs> on the podcast, that's going to sound like seamless. Yeah, totally. And then, and then you know, there's this huge five minute gap that Barrett's going to edit out and probably put it at the end of the outtakes. Oh my god! Uh, but um, anybody pissed off about anything? <laughs> I feel like I'm taking crazy pills. I'm as mad as hell. You've never seen me very upset. Lord Jesus! Lord Jesus! <laughs> I'm having too much fun. Okay, so I'm angry about a couple things. I'll go first. Um, so I was watching Columbiana the other day. Oh, all right. Which is a Zoe Saldana, 
hot girl assassin movie. Surprise, surprise, written by Luc Besson. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, really? Who I think 90% of the movies he makes are about hot girl assassins. Yes. Yep. Yes. Uh, have you ever seen this movie? No. Uh, when did it come out? Oh, 2004? Like, okay. It was more like 2011, 12. That's exactly what he said. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, not bad. Right. Not great. Um, you know, she's a little kid. Some drug lord killed her parents right in front of her. She escaped, trained ever since then to be an assassin. She's great at the action stuff and the kicking ass. My, 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 my point here is about, um, I want to rant about this super obvious Chekhov's gun shit that I'm starting to see in movies. Mm. Cause in this movie, she's, she's basically taking assassin jobs from her uncle. Um, but whenever she finds somebody connected to this cartel that killed her parents, she also kills them. One of the jobs she takes from her uncle, this is about halfway through the movie, is this drug lord on an island in the Caribbean, and you got to go in there, he's got all these guards with guns, there's like 30 of them, and you got to kill this guy. And she's like, okay, here I go. And then we cut to the drug lord, and he's got a pool Mm -hmm. with glass square windows on top of it, and sharks swimming in the pool. Ah. And a hot girl in a bikini laying on the glass. And she says, I want to go for a swim. And he says, if one drop of your blood... Got into that water. <laughs> Those sharks would tear you down to bones. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm like, gee, I wonder how this drug lord is going to die. And of course, <laughs> he is killed because Zoe Salana Colombiana breaks the glass and puts him down into the water. And there's blood and the sharks come and yeah. eat him. Uh-huh. And there's no reason for that fucking scene, except you felt the need to set up for the audience Oh, remember how sharks like blood? <laughs> like, we've forgotten yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, every shark movie in the world doesn't mention yes. that. If we'd seen a pool with sharks underneath and glass, I think we could have followed what happened. Yeah. But yeah. you wanted to set it up. It's like this call and answer kind of thing that movies are starting to do to one another. We made that joke in Skyscraper, mm. where they make this huge deal out of this three-story city park that they've built in the middle of this ginormous yes. city. We called, I think we called it Chekhov's 30-story thir- <laughs> yeah. story park. Because right. <laughs> it's so obvious we're going to be back here later as a set piece. And it's just it's starting to bother me. The Colombiano one really, really shocked me. Because I was like, wow, that was it's almost, you might as well just put a sign up that said, hey, pay attention to this. Yeah. It's going to come uh, back in literally five minutes. <laughs> this reminds me of the uh, the Haley Steinfeld thing in Bumblebee that she's a, a <laughs> no yeah a diver Chekhov's diver <laughs> Chekhov's diver essentially because none of that diving shit matters and even when it does matter it doesn't matter that no. much no it doesn't you know it's like I've got to dive down there and save a robot yeah and I've got to take a this, robot this, by the this hand. ten ton robot I'm gonna be able to get him out of the pool uh, if I jump down in there well it's a uh, gymnastic girl in Lost World <laughs> yep. Jurassic Park yep. is the same kind of thing yeah. there's no reason for her to be a gymnast except somebody storyboarded a scene where she double pommel horses a T-Rex in the mouth or something yeah. and we just have to have it in there yeah <laughs> I like the movies that that subvert it. Like uh, Deadpool does this to a certain extent, but John Wick three in particular, because that whole final battle is in this glass office, and you're like, okay, what's yeah. going to happen here? Yeah. Like, how are they going to make this as humorously dangerous as humanly possible? <laughs> yeah. yeah, and like, oh, 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 there that goes, there that goes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Have you seen John Wick uh, three again? Mm-hmm. Did you watch it again? Yeah, I. Uh, it's coming on Blu-ray. It should be here today. Yeah, it's today. And then uh, I've. I've bought it on digital you watch it on the I've digital watch yeah. it one and a half times on amazon is it delightful yeah it's yeah. every bit as delightful and it's it's the perfect put on in the background movie yeah, because yeah. i can literally stop working at any point in that movie <laughs> and turn over and within five minutes i'm gonna be laughing my ass off. <laughs> so oh yeah we're gonna have to get dicer in here and have him explain his I saw his, his stance about this movie oh he doesn't like it well no he actually and he was very specific about not commenting further but john wick one action plus character work plus world building john wick two action plus world building john wick three just action mm. and i'm like what I, I didn't want to get into it mm. and i knew this was one of those tweets that if i replied i was going to overshadow his own point <laughs> but my con- counter to that is i i don't disagree i am glad that the series finally stopped trying to do character work and world building right. because it's been getting in the way of action this redonkulous yeah i agree i think i think after you've built your world as they clearly have it's an, an insane world where we pretty much know the whole ins and outs of everything 
from John Wick two. Yeah. And then and then like by the time it gets to three, it's like okay, yeah, we we know all that. Let's get into the the ass beating. Yep. Mm -hmm. Boy, does it. Yeah. I've got a I've got an interesting thought more more so than a rant. Mm Hmm. So Venice Film Festival just concluded Mm -hmm. uh, as of last week when this posts, and. So the big winners were Joker for the the Golden Lion, whatever that is, and then mm-hmm. the the Silver Fox or whatever it is. Goes <laughs> yeah. to, the quick brown, brown fox <laughs> went to Roman Polanski for his movie Boo. An Officer and a Spy. Now, okay. his mo- I, I haven't seen either of these movies. Obviously, none of us have. The Officer and a Spy is about the Dreyfus affair, which was a oh Richard Dreyfus life story. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah. exactly. And Julia Louis Dreyfus, which is about just a crazy set of circumstances of a Jewish officer, high level officer, being just wrongly accused and exiled for years and years, and just one of the classic tales of anti Semitism before it really became prevalent over the, the the world wars. And so that's interesting. That's an interesting subject matter. Polanski has Jewish background. And it, it's probably a very good movie. Joker may be a very, very good movie. In fact, it probably is a really good movie. But do we have to have these two win these awards? Do we have to? Well, do we have to? I don't get. I don't get the Polanski thing. Right. Because Polanski more so for sure. What? It's been known about him for years and years, and plenty of Hollywood was willing to continue making films with him. Mm-hmm. And then a few years ago. At the start of what a lot of people are just calling the Me Too era, which I don't really know that we need to give a name, but Polanski was redragged, kicked out of the MPAA. Mm-hmm. Um, I've I've done enough research to know what I, what what happened, and this guy shouldn't be allowed to make films, let alone celebrated for making them. He, this motherfucker is suing to get back into the MPAA, to get back into the Academy. Yep, not the MPAA. And I am just not here for it. Yeah. I really am not. I don't really care. It's it, For me, what's fascinating is how every country, every region of the world seems to be willing to forgive some heinous crime if the artist is good enough. So we've got, not that it's the same crime, but we got Chris Brown over here winning awards, breaking sales records for his latest album, touring, making millions. I don't feel like that's right yeah and it's it's a judgment call i know there's some of you listening that are probably maybe even chris is saying like i can totally separate art from artists and i've said that in the past there are for some reason there are cases in the case of roman polanski who has some movies that i adore like chinatown um in the case of chris brown where i just am not gonna go back there i cannot I cannot do that with that. Now, I shouldn't necessarily be looping Joker in with this discussion because that, as we've discussed, may be a a bad time for this to come out. That's a whole separate issue. But the Polanski thing in particular did bother me because it's so well publicized. He's admitted to it. He's apologized to the 13-year-old girl, whatever age she is now. And so, like, I'm, I'm, I'm just not on board the Polanski train. Um... Yeah, I mean, you've got probably I'm I'm I don't know what the estimate would be on this, but don't you get the sense that about 20 to 30% of the people in the world don't think anything he did anything wrong or that he's paid for what he's done? Probably, yeah. Also, yeah. Roman Polanski gets the brunt of all this and we forget about other people, especially in the 70s, who either dated or fucked around with underage girls who mm. were either groupies like jimmy page was always accused of that mm. and uh uh peter bogdanovich definitely was yeah. uh we they don't have the same stigma as polanski for some reason and i've never like gone to just study the differences in the cases or anything but i feel like if you're going to draw the line somewhere they've crossed it as well yeah bogdanovich and, was in fucking it t- part two wasn't he? yeah he was he was in it part two and like uh and uh, and you know we talk about this stuff like wow that that's a crazy time back then in the 70s wasn't Mm -hmm. it huh why do i hate polanski so much and not hate bogdanovich yeah yeah. well i agree with you then there are probably some that we'll never know about at least with polanski's case he drugged that girl yeah okay so maybe that's what it is maybe that's the difference i didn't know that he did i didn't know i mean i like i said all i know is the underage part Mm -hmm. i didn't hear about the drugging there yeah that was part of the charges brought against him now i mean there's there's other layers to this story 
about the judge retracting his probation and saying he's going to put him away for 50 years. And that was the reason that he went into exile. But it doesn't change the fact that he drugged and raped a 13 year old girl. Mm. I ain't getting fucking past that. Yeah. I don't know if I'm getting past that with uh, with Spacey and his his shit with uh, with the underage and boy. Yet, and yet, interestingly enough, where is he now? He's in Europe doing fucking performance art on the street and nobody seems to care yeah so there are are... different feelings about this kind of thing in different regions of the like and i understand that yeah you know i mean Mm -hmm. i just feel like uh, it's a fucking confusing time to be alive and we all have to draw our own lines i agree i respect where everybody draws their lines i'm not gonna watch or celebrate any roman polanski film yes and my point about this is everybody can make up their own mind Venice Film Festival can do whatever they want to. I'm just saying, like, there are a lot of filmmakers out there. There are a lot of really good filmmakers. Now, Roman Polanski is a great filmmaker. Uh, but, like, let's let's maybe move on. Let's let's try something else. Let's maybe that's not the best. That's not the best time to celebrate somebody yeah, that's got this. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It almost feels like a lot of times these award these festivals try to award something that will get people talking. Yeah. And maybe maybe this movie's good, maybe it is, but you know, is it the best one that they saw? I'm gonna say probably not. Right. Joker's the same way. Joker's probably uh, it's either better than they thought it would be, or right. they were they were seduced by a Joaquin Phoenix performance or mm. something like that. You know, we don't know until we see them, obviously. Yeah. Um, but a lot of times when you hear whatever movie came out of a festival as the hot shit. It's not the one that we end up talking about anyway. Mm-hmm. So yeah, and it's a shame because I I actually would love to see this story about the Dreyfus affair, and it may have been fictionalized somewhere else, but I would love to see this put to film. I probably just won't see it just because I I don't want to support. That's my thing. I don't want to support uh, this this guy's art. Now, will I watch a Woody Allen film from the past? Yeah, I'm a hypocrite. Uh, you know, well, well, that I don't think I don't it's think that different makes you a hypocrite. Again, there was uh, were there. Have, have, uh, yeah, this is such a murky fucking topic. Mm-hmm. But Scarlett Johansson jumped in on Woody. She sure did man. <laughs> earlier this week. And she <laughs> always seems to take the brunt yeah. of this stuff. Doesn't well, she? she said, "I love him. I support him. I work with him again." And I saw somebody on Twitter said, "Is she trying to like win the award for most problematic?" Exactly, actress? because she says, "I believe him." Yeah, yeah, it was the most crazy part of that yeah. whole thing. It's like, man, but we we know other people that believe him. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. And yes, we do. I certainly don't know, but I know <laughs> he didn't leave the country for 50 years to yeah. avoid having to ever face any music. Yeah. 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 So, you know, that's that's my rant. Like, I tell you, I had a visceral reaction when I saw that. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm just like, Polanski wins a uh, Silver Lion or whatever. I'm like, yeah. 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 I'm ready it- for Joker to be an amazing performance by Joaquin, mm-hmm. and I'm sadly expecting it to be celebrated by the wrong people yeah and hopefully not and hopefully not but it, we'll see yeah, yeah, yeah i would love it to be awesome yeah i won't see the other one the polanski one I go see no, okay one. polanski's yeah, and, joker and i i think i think i haven't quite drawn that line of i'm not gonna watch something mm. or whatever i think there are in every production you can probably find some asshole who's done something like we just don't know mm-hmm. you know we just don't know that that person's done something or whatever it's like i guess does it make it different that we do know maybe it does i don't know yeah. I, I i'm not gonna go out of my way to see it but if it's something where somebody says hey watch this and i have a chance to see it i'm gonna watch it probably yeah, yeah. i um, haven't stopped that- watching chinatown i was gonna say and that's okay yeah mm-hmm. that's all right i don't I- think i think that's kind of the point is that we're in this brave new era of brave new era. We're in this new era where everybody's shit is laid bare for everybody else. And everybody else can walk right up to the digital front door of any famous person and barf on their lawn. And, mm-hmm. you know, we all have to draw our lines where yeah. everybody's skeletons are eventually coming out of the closet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What I hope I live to see is this massive wave of arrests based on DNA evidence and this ancestry and 23 and Me and all <laughs> the DNA that has been left at crime scenes for 50 years and was collected and can now be measured. Mm-hmm. Think, like that Golden State Killer they caught. Mm-hmm. That's going to happen for like all of us. 
Nice. Mm-hmm. Sweet. Yeah. Because <laughs> I didn't do any of it. If it's going to be rad, it's going to be like, Tom <laughs> Hanks committed murder? Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> he, and then he jerked off all over the scene. He's such an evil bastard. I had no idea. <laughs> I'm sorry, Tom Hanks. I don't I know wish why there I chose was, you. I wish there was semen everywhere. Uh, <laughs> yeah, just, yeah, yeah. just boom, yeah. boom. Just yeah. semen. Well, can everywhere. you imagine what that would be like to see? <laughs> I would to, love to it. See, <laughs> to see Tom Hanks in his usual, like, I'm, I'm pimping this movie movie mode where he's just like is this fun lovable level like but he just happens to be talking about jerking off dead bodies <laughs> you know early in his career he wouldn't have i mean he wouldn't have shied away from that kind of blue material true. um you, you guys have movie rants and here i am i'm talking about other shit in the world traffic yeah. no i won't be talking about traffic today however uh i could go i could do whole podcasts on those by the way <laughs> um but uh do you, you guys go to sports bars every once in a while right mm-hmm. do you ever go on like a sunday where there all the games are playing mm-hmm. and all that i have all right do you ever go to a sports bar that doesn't have a game playing Ooh. on a certain tv Oh. And they are the advertise. They advertise themselves as this. We have all the games type sports bar. No, but they don't have the game. Sometimes they don't have the game, and you have to ask them. So, I I run into this problem at this one particular place, but I have also run into it at other places in the world too. And if you're gonna bother having the TVs up for people to watch sports. And you're advertising yourself as this, we have all the games type of thing. You should have some sort of like lockdown on having all the games. <laughs> um, and you should have like your TV set up where it's like, okay, here's what the NFL schedule says at uh, 12 o'clock. We are going to have this game here, this game here, this game here. And we're in Nashville, so the Titans game has to be on four probably uh, TVs around so that everybody can see it and so on. Now, uh, this game that wasn't on today, wasn't on this past Sunday, wasn't a big deal. It was Ravens Dolphins. That game was well out of hand before, Mm -hmm. before it, it didn't matter. However, that's, that's, but that's a that's not an anomaly that happens all the time mm. and in the in the year of in and in the age of fantasy football and all this like type of stuff and again i'm talking about american rules football guys <laughs> i know we have european viewers who are <laughs> who are like that's not football um but uh the the problem then becomes though when you ask somebody could you put that game on first mm. off it seems like it's the biggest deal to, to ask them how to do it. So you ask your waiter uh, or you go, uh, yeah, could you change this one TV? Because it seems like we've got like two or three of the same game over here. I feel like that game's well represented. And they'll be like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll go get the I'll go get the person who handles that. Mm-hmm. So they walk off and then it's like another 10 minutes goes by and they come back and they're like refilling your waters and your Diet Cokes and stuff. And they're like, Oh, did they not come back and change that? Oh, well, I'll need to go. And it's like, or they won't even acknowledge. They won't even acknowledge that it happened. And so finally, you'll see a guy come out with a remote and he'll be like, like changing stuff around. And then they'll be like, oh, we can't change this one TV because we have everything automatically set up so that this game comes on at three o'clock and all this other stuff. And you're like, we live in 2019. <laughs> your excuses are your own. Um, I, I, I don't, I, I don't, I don't quite understand that. That like we've got this set up to where we can't change it. <laughs> there's, there's no such thing. There's no such <laughs> that's, thing. That's true, in my opinion. And, uh, and then like, uh, if you do happen to stay for the three o'clock, a lot of times the three o'clock games will they'll change over and there'll still be something that's missing oh and you, seriously and you'll be like wait a minute you have this all like programmed out and everything and we still have like two games that aren't playing there's no excuse for yeah, that. yeah it doesn't make any sense it doesn't make sense it doesn't make sense <laughs> so yeah anyway small rant it's not it's not that important it i mean we missed ravens dolphins what do you expect um but you know there was some diehard ravens fan in the back corner who was loving that blowout like don't change it yeah 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 no you should have everything if you represent having the entire 
Uh, even if it's EPL or if it's something like that, like if you have the entirety of that package, show it all. Not That's to it. mention with Thursday games, Monday games, and Sunday night games, and then two sets of Sunday games, there mm -hmm. should never be more than like maximum like eight or nine yeah, games. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In this yeah, one yeah. place that I go to, there are probably, uh, for the whole place, 30 TVs mm -hmm. in there. And... Uh, and like, it's understandable that you have to have duplicates, uh, all along the way because that, you know, where you're set up. Yeah. It's position, where you're set yeah. up. Uh, but like when, when you're, when you see a Titans game right next to another Titans game, it's like, okay, in my field of vision, I don't know who couldn't possibly see that one or the other. So mm -hmm. that one can be the other game, you know, that one that we're missing. Yep. And like I said, it's more because of fantasy purposes these days. You don't really care about Ravens, Dolphins, or no, anything I mean, like if, that. No, I mean, if there is a fan that does show up that says, you know, I, you know, I'm going to get there early. I'm going to get in position. Just give me one TV, and mm -hmm. I'm, I'm good. I'm going to buy a bunch of beer. When I was living in Chicago, there was a place right down the street from me that was a Bears bar, obviously, but it had really good chicken wings and uh, and like dollar beers or something like that crazy <laughs> dollar beers dollar beers damn uh for for the you know on sundays and so i went down there because the packers game wasn't on tv so i was like all right i'll go down they had the sunday ticket they had every every game out there and of course they had seven tvs set up for bears games and stuff like that there was one that was showing like it was green bay cincinnati i'm a packers fan and so i was like I, I, hey, can can we keep that there? I'll sit right here. The bartender was super nice, and so the manager came over and uh, and switched it to something else, to another game. And I was like, "Hey, do you mind putting it back on the the Green Bay game?" And he was like, "Oh, uh, yeah, let me get that for you." He put it on the Oprah Network and walked away. <laughs> oh, God, what a dick! As Chicago and Green Bay fans are are very antagonistic. Yeah. So I paid my bill and left. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I tipped the bartender, but not. Uh, yeah. That's funny. Gave him the fuck you. Yeah. On the way out. Yeah. Yeah. Fucking bears. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Fucking Packers. Uh, <laughs> so um, we are going to be talking about the heart of the movie. Of the movie. We've got heart. You got hard, kid. That thing uh, today, I like um, this thing. Uh, Been trying to get down to the heart of the movie. Yes, <laughs> um, that's the first Don Henley ever on the show. <laughs> yes, it might be. I think so. Uh, so, who wants to take it away? I'll do one that's that's relevant. Mm. Oh, uh, so ours, ours, ours are not. irrelevant. That's yes. right. That's Dickhead. Right. It Chapter 2 came out. We just did a mini pod about it. Mini pod. <clears throat> Spoiler, we didn't like it very much. <laughs> <laughs> but it made me realize how much I love It Chapter 1. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, God, everything in, in that movie works so perfectly. You said it recently, Jeremy. You were like, it's not really about the horror. It's about like the coming of age and the nostalgia yeah. and all that stuff. It's cool that they set it in 1989 instead of the original book was 1960. So it's it's more kind of uh, of a cultural touchstone for people of our age, yeah. and that kind of thing. And so, uh, so yeah, I was thinking about that. And I was like, man, what is what is the heart of that movie? Because you got the the introduction of Pennywise when Georgie goes to the the drain and all that stuff. You even have the scene that we were talking about in the quarry where they all jump in and they're all being still, they're swimming and they're having fun and they're interacting. And you have those wonderful still shots of Beverly and bill and all that stuff. And that's a great moment in that movie. But my, what I think if you removed would really affect the entirety of the movie is the blood cleanup in the bathroom at Beverly's place, Ooh. <laughs> because it's, the, for, it's a great setup. So you've got this horrific thing where this is, Beverly's first encounter with it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's where she goes into the drain or she looks into the drain and it spews blood everywhere. Be beautiful effects, like really well done. She is horrified. She's in the corner just with this. Sophie Lillis is just a great actress. Mm -hmm. uh, she's got this crazy thing. And then dad comes in and dad can't see the blood or chooses not to or whatever. Mm -hmm. Makes like it's, it doesn't. So she thinks, A, she's horrified because of this. B, she thinks she's crazy because the dad doesn't see it. So she calls all the other losers to come over. It's during the middle of the day. And she's like, I wanted to see if you guys see this. And they come in and they see it. And in that moment, she is so relieved that she's not crazy. And in that moment, 
that whole team of kids decides, fuck it, man. We're not really all that scared of this guy or this entity. We're going to clean it up. And then cue that cure song. This is stranger than I thought. <laughs> and they're just wiping it down. They're working it. <laughs> Such a great song. And, uh, and they're wiping it down. They're getting, they're building camaraderie. They're starting to say, fuck you, man. We're not, we're not scared of you anymore. We're coalescing as a group. That's one of my favorite scenes in any horror movie. Cohesive. Mm. Yeah. Cohesive. Mm. Um, I think you're right. Yeah. I think that's a good call. I would probably, if I was choosing this movie, one of the things I like about this heart of the movie discussion is that we can disagree and still agree on yeah. certain elements. I would probably make it the quarry scene. It's um, it's right up there. <clears throat> but I get what you're saying. I wonder. I do wonder, though, aside from that, why don't they clean it up? Because Cause I, it's I'll not there, what. right? It is there. It is there. That's the whole point. Just because the the adults can't see it doesn't mean it's not there. Because it physically, you see them get all that shit out of there, the the big blankets and the towels and all that stuff. That is real. How do you know? The movie presents it as that being the real, and then the adults either ignoring or hallucinating it that, that they don't notice it. Okay, but then... I'm genuinely curious on this because I just I watch that movie and I assume everything that I see it do is fake. Hmm. Well, okay. So I mean, granted, he he bites off that kid's arm and that does, that's not very fake. But well, that's the problem with this character, and it gets really exaggerated in the second one. Mm-hmm. But we we don't necessarily for hundred percent know what's real or not. To me, in that moment, they're definitely taking some sort of detritus off of the walls. They're definitely bringing all that stuff out. And just because the adults can't see it doesn't mean that it's not there. Okay. But you're right that there's most of the stuff that he does. Having not read the book. is he'll, Yeah, I, I, I have, don't know if I, I had always it. assumed that he only has power over the kids. Now, that's, that's not yeah. true once they come back and right. they're adults and he starts showing up to them. And that's a whole other can of questions. Yeah. Would the adult version of these children see the blood? They apparently do. Yeah. 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 I don't That's know. That's another yada yada thing. I mm-hmm. like your pick on the scene, though. Yeah. But I've always wondered at that scene, like, hey, dad didn't see it. Like, that's just a chore you don't have to do. <laughs> 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 Go play some basketball. But the, but the fact that they do it, it to, and especially together, is saying, like, fuck you, man. No, he, I could, agree. he could totally come back while they're doing it. In fact, I almost expected it while they were cleaning they this set up. it up because they leave the look, lookout kid. Yeah, to, yeah, exactly. No, no, I'm not talking about the dad. I'm talking about uh, Pennywise. Oh, Pennywise. Like, he could just be like, all right, all clean. Boosh! Yeah. yeah. Do it again. Yeah, yeah. But I think the fact that they're taking some sort of control over works emotionally and practically story-wise, too. Ooh, ooh, so ooh, that, uh, that I, I tried taking little sections out of that movie, mm-hmm. and that one was the one that I think is a key. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. What do you think? Um, so this, this scene is actually is one shot. And it's and I, I don't know if you take it out, the movie is any different, really. But it does. This shot is uh, in uh, all the president's men when they're in the Library of Congress. Mm-hmm. Um, is one of those things that's like, oh, that's cool. Look at how they did that. They have the camera just kind of like moving up from the from the from the desk that they're sitting at, and it goes all the way up. And there's that great score and everything. And um. But uh, when you when you think about that, it's more than just a cool shot because it really it really sort of tells you what kind of thing they're up against in this. Mm. When they go up and they ask that dude if he they have like all the I think it's like names of people who've checked out certain books and all this. I can't remember exactly what it is, but uh, they've been they've been running into people who just won't give them any information the entire time. And this guy, who's probably like new to the job, is like, "You need all of those? <laughs> okay, uh, it's a lot of them, but uh, you know, whatever." <laughs> and he goes back and he brings all these bricks full of like just cards that they're going to have to look through to find any names whatsoever that's going to help them with this with this job. And, um, and so like they just put these stacks of these cards down on this, these, on this desk and they just have to sift through every single one of them. And I feel like the entire investigation is like this. Mm. The whole investigation is them trying to find any crumb whatsoever that will lead them to something bigger. And this is sort of the start of it, really. 
because nobody is saying anything. Nobody wants to say one word to them on the phone. So when they when when this camera moves up, and I don't rem- I don't know how they did this shot. I'm sure that there's a whole tutorial on how they did this. <laughs> uh, they probably like tied the camera up by a rope or something and pulled it up or something. But like, um, uh, it also shows them sort of literally on an island. They're the only people who are actually looking into this. Yeah, into this thing. There might be other reporters out there who think there's some go- some shenanigans going on in the Nixon administration, but it does really seem like these two guys are the most focused on it. And when the camera moves out, you realize how alone they are huh. and how how like no one else is out there to help them. They have to find this on their own. This is a job that many men should take. Many people should take, uh, you know, to uh, to find a name and they're doing it by themselves. <laughs> and so while this while this scene doesn't actually have to be in the movie for mm. them to do the things that we see them do in there, I do feel like at least symbolically it's the heart of the movie yeah. <laughs> because it tells you exactly what they're up against. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. This is why I like this topic. We should always do this topic like once a month because mm-hmm. it, it's not it, it it allows us a peek inside the mind of the other person and and what makes a movie important to them. I like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I wanted to mention something that's why I'm looking this up. Um in 2016 I just caught a documentary uh called All Governments Lie Truth Deception in the the Spirit of I.F. Stone. Um and Carl Bernstein is in this too. Mm-hmm. Uh I don't think Bar- Bob Woodward was but yeah, it was it was all about so I have Stone was apparently this legendary dogged reporter that that would leave no stone unturned. And the whole point of the documentary was all these investigative journalism uh pros that are getting turned down from mass media uh, because they're they're poking too much into it. Mm-hmm. And so the spirit of that I think Carl Bernstein himself was saying like this is not about, you know, the 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 gotcha moment or the deep throat moment or this moment it was literally sifting through pages and pages and pages and pages and pages mm-hmm. and then putting all that stuff together yeah it's very very cool it's like court you watch court in a movie or tv show and you think it's all dramatic yes. <laughs> and whammy moments and whatnot and it's 99 percent boring like procedural yeah, yeah, yeah. filing of documents yeah. and motions and blah 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 blah, blah. yeah bunch of disappointed lawyers out there who thought it was going to be all Perry Mason. Well, and, the, and the problem with certain things like this, the like Watergate and everything is, uh, is that the, there are very few people on this earth who can steal themselves up to do that kind of job. Yeah. To, to, because they do want it to be all dramatic and like, ha ha mm-hmm. everything that they look at, but you don't get to those moments without doing a whole bunch of like, you know, just really boring things yeah, yeah, yeah. it's like watching a soccer match no, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> well i think it's not unlike um you know i think it's movie fans tend to romanticize what it's like to direct a movie yeah and i think directing a movie is a lot of work people don't think about dotting the i's and crossing the t's and that kind of filing of the paperwork and the motions and the whatnot. And there's a lot of, it's not all glamour and glitz and roll camera. Yeah. <laughs> uh, by the way, I saw Dick the other day. Oh yeah. Kirsten Dunst and Michelle Williams. <laughs> um, and they're, they're the ones that are deep throat in the right. movie. And Woodward and Bernstein is Will Ferrell. And that uh, guy from Bruce Kids in the McCullough? Hall, Bruce McCullough. Yeah. <laughs> and Bruce McCullough is all competitive. And Will Ferrell's like trying to keep the story from him. Uh, anyway, yeah. they heard him on the, they heard the Nixon <laughs> tapes in the White House, they heard him be mean to the dog. And that's why they turned him in. Oh, yeah, that's <laughs> right. You were mean to checkers. And what was it? The, there's a, What was the part in there? Was like uh, the Bruce McCullough character, I think, is like, why can't I talk to him, talk to Deep Throat? I'm the only one who saw that movie or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> so you, uh, so the, the scene in particular is the one in the Library of Congress where they're pulling out. Yeah, the camera moves up. I don't nice. know how they did it in uh and it just shows them sort of on an island basically as the camera moves up and it shows they're alone. They're sifting through thousands of these like innocuous library yeah. like checkout things. Wow. And uh and they're just having to find they're trying to find any name whatsoever yeah. or any connection whatsoever and while I like I said while I said while I think that that take you just take it out it's the it's essentially the same movie 
you know it's a it's a scene that i really think sort of explores what they're going up against sure sure and everything nice so. nice my wife has this habit it's endearing to me <clears throat> of getting something new like a new pair of shoes or a new jacket and then not using it for months at a time because once she uses it she knows it's going to start to deteriorate and she calls it her precious with lord of the rings kind of <laughs> mm-hmm. so we were well, I remember one christmas she got this really cool looking black jacket that was like modern and and she needed a new winter jacket and i just didn't see her wearing it and i was like why don't you wear that jacket she's like oh, i don't want to ruin it i don't want to get anything on it and then it's my precious i gotta keep it you know <laughs> and then eventually she she moves on and starts wearing it and she buy another precious <clears throat> in the movie sideways um Miles has this bottle of wine mm-hmm. at home that's mm-hmm. really expensive. It's mm-hmm. his precious. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's talking to, uh, I can't remember the character's name. can't remember the actress's name. Virginia Madsen. Madsen. Virginia Madsen. Um, he's talking to her about wine and tells her he's got this bottle. And she's like, oh, you, you, what are you saving it for? It might even be bad by now. He's like, well, we were saving it for our anniversary. He's divorced now. I guess I've just been waiting for a special occasion. And she says, no, the bottle is the special occasion. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. Um, and there are a lot of moments in this movie that I could pick as the heart of the movie and make a strong argument, especially where he finds out his book got rejected and he drinks the spit bucket water mm-hmm. and just kind of has sort of a depression, depressive awakening. Mm-hmm. I choose the very, very end when he has lost the girl. His friend has gotten married off. And he takes that bottle, that super expensive rare wine, and he goes to fucking Hardee's or whatever. It looks like a Whataburger or something. <laughs> yeah. And he's eating fast food, discreetly pouring that fancy wine into the styrofoam cup, and he's living. Yeah. He, he is finally enjoying life for what it is, not holding off life for some perfect set of circumstances that are likely never going to come again. So that is that character's key turn, right? That's the only way we really know that he's had an arc and has decided to change. That's true, because he hasn't changed at all. No, the whole time. and now he drives back up to see her again, I think, well, after that, after that yeah, scene. Yeah, yeah. But for the most part, that's how we know these events have affected him yeah, permanently. Yeah. Um, and I need to watch that movie again. Yeah, me too. It's not on any of the movie channels, I don't think. It's mm-hmm. frustrating. I actually thought, and I, I agree with you, though, uh, but I actually thought you were going to bring up the scene where she's talking about the how it tastes different no depending on what day you open it up yeah yeah and everything and she's talking about herself essentially and then by the end of it she says but by the time you, fi- you finally do open it and taste it it tastes so fucking good <laughs> and paul giamatti's got that look on his face like i've got a boner <laughs> <laughs> I think even he asked to go to the bathroom right yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. <laughs> i actually do that do you do that like i've got i've got bottles of like liquor and like the, one guy from japan gave me a bottle of shochu which is like japanese vodka and uh, about a year later, he came over to the house and it, I hadn't opened it because I was saving it for a special occasion. He was like, you should have drank that by now. Like the whole thing was a gift. I wanted I you think, to enjoy it. I think it's very human nature for all of us to do that kind of thing on small scale. And mm. I, I think even in this movie, it's more symbolic than like, I don't think the movie is saying don't ever save a bottle of wine yeah, for a yeah, special yeah, occasion. Yeah, yeah. It's just saying that in his particular case, he's waiting for he's essentially waiting for his wife to come running back to him and she's never going to do it and he has to make peace with that. But I do the same thing. My, like I said, I started with my wife and her jacket and her precious and, <laughs> where you buy like a really nice, you know, box of chocolate, box of chocolate. Yeah. <laughs> I don't fucking come from. Yeah. But more of, it's more like food for me if I'll buy some kind of food thing that I really like and I'll hold off eating it because I don't want to, or like, oh, it's my, it's my yearly Chex Mix at Thanksgiving. I always make, <laughs> oh, yeah. I always make Chex Mix and that shit's delicious. And I don't want it to be gone, so I just I actually make more. well, yeah, I could. It's pretty easy. <laughs> but then it's then it's not special anymore. No, it's not special anymore. <laughs> it's uh, extra. I cheated. Uh, so Fargo, yeah, Fargo is a great movie. I, I was trying to pinpoint why Fargo is so rewatchable though, mm-hmm. because yeah, you, know, you get the accents, you get the the quirky performances and stuff like that. But uh, you know, there there are probably better and more expansive cohen universes than than uh fargo and so i was thinking like you know what 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 would be the soul or the the heart of this particular movie and it i thought it was one scene but it's two scenes so it's both scenes in uh jerry lundegaard's office okay mm. mr lundegaard so 
Uh, I thought because they it, it really does the first time she comes in there is fairly late in the movie mm-hmm. uh, because she's had to put uh, this is Marge uh, Gunderson she's had to put all these pieces together to even get to William H Macy mm-hmm. at this point and so she does in the first time that she comes in only maybe like a minute minute and a half long scene where she comes in and she's like can I sit down I can carry in quite a load mm-hmm. and so she does and she asks him if there's anything missing off the lot and there's that great long awkward pause with William H. Macy Mm -hmm. where he's like so Brainerd huh yeah 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 (laughs) and she's like yeah you know I'm a babe the blue ox and all that stuff and uh and it never goes anywhere Mm -hmm. he's just like uh okay well no no we we haven't had anything and then so she leaves and he calls Shep and all that stuff and yes you see that she's she's picked up on something but she hasn't put the pieces together at Mm -hmm. all and then the second time she comes in she knows that there's been a call made and she's she knows that it's come from the cutlass has come from that lot and she's got him. And so he's still trying to get off because he got off fairly scot free that first time. Yeah. And so he's trying to he, he's like, ah, I can handle her. And she still says the same thing. She's like, I got you carrying quite a load. Can I sit down? And he just gets belligerent like immediately with them. And she's still trying to play it off. And then t- finally, he's like, I'm working with you here. <laughs> and she's like, you got no cost to get snippy with me, Mr. Lundekart. Yeah. <laughs> and she has to see like his dad or his, uh, his uh, father-in-law and all that stuff. And then it all breaks down with the whole, ah, go do a lot check if it's so damn important to yeah. you. What the Christ? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, well, look, look. <laughs> and she's, uh, she's shocked. She's like, what? Okay, thanks, you know. <laughs> and then she's, and, and it ends with, oh, he's fleeing the interview. Yeah. He's fleeing the interview. <laughs> she's yelling out to nobody in particular. But those two scenes, if you lose those, not only obviously story wise, that wouldn't, that wouldn't make a whole lot of sense, but I think those interactions, because they're both master, master actors and playing off of each other is my favorite part of that movie. The, um, it's funny because, they, because you talk about these two scenes, I immediately think of the the Mike Yanagita scene. Yep, and uh, how it's it's very possible that she is great at regular detective work, but hasn't been good at reading people because people have been like very very nice, and they seem to be uh, on the surface what exactly what they are mm-hmm. and everything like that. And then the Mike Yanagita scene happens where he tells this whole like basically just a big huge lie to her the entire time and it isn't until she calls one of her friends and the friend says oh no she he stalked that woman that he said he was married (laughs) to that's when he she finally gets to the idea that people aren't exactly what they are face value yeah yeah and like i i can almost i can i'm i almost say that at the beginning of this this first interview she has no clue anything's going on i agree i agree and and then and then it's only after the stuff that she's gone through and like wait a minute people out here are kind of like dishonest yeah you know? yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and, and, and she's done the work she's do, she's put the things together like you know she's good at her job because when they start uh looking at the the wreck and everything <laughs> and she goes through all that like uh dli plates yeah yeah dealer i think they're dealer plates you know <laughs> and all that and she goes she knows exactly how the the shootings must have taken place and all that you know she's good at all that but maybe not so good at reading people and that it takes that mike yanagita scene to yeah. get to that point but i think you're right i think the lundegaard scenes are probably the heart of it yeah whereas the yanagita scene you're like what the fuck was that i know <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean no there's, genie there's, no money <laughs> <laughs> they're they're so and this is a midwestern thing particularly in minnesota they're famous for their politeness yeah yeah even when like he's being belligerent it's the most polite belligerent that you can get yeah. he's like i'm not i'm yeah. not doing I'm, yeah. I'm working with you here yeah. Yeah. i'm playing yeah. ball here yeah. you know and she's and that snippy to her you know yeah, this is so this is an aside but all that car dealership stuff reminded me of that there's the one early scene where like the couple comes in to buy the car and uh and the guy's like we've been talking about here we talking in circles you 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 keep saying the same thing over and over again and all that and he goes uh he goes like he's like yeah but uh you know this true coat man this true coat <laughs> and he's like he's like he's like uh he's like i'm paying i'm paying uh, 20, uh 35 for this vehicle right here and i'm not he's like he's like well i'll go i'll go i'll, I'll go to the manager okay he goes come goes in he 
talks to the manager about something really innocuous, <laughs> some bullshit. And then he comes back and he's like, we've never done this before. When they say we can take a hundred dollars off that true coat. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and the guy's like, you lied to me, Mr. Lundegaard. You're nothing but a bald faced liar. A fucking liar. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh Jesus man. Christ! I love that movie so much. Yeah, it's a good yeah. absolutely. Um, I was trying to think of what the heart of Get Out was. Ooh. Oh, I actually considered this movie. Yeah, Ooh. yes. I was going through it, and I can't. I it, there. You know the. There's a lot of like scenes that seem perfectly like the like that would be the one. Like the first time he goes to the sunken place, you might think that might be one, but. I really do think it's that almost hit a deer thing or hit the deer thing at the beginning. Ooh. Interesting. Um, because there's so much that is said about the characters themselves after this happens. And I told you before, when we, when we first watched this and we mini potted it and all that, like it's one of those scenes that they put in horror movies that you're like, Oh my God, a deer came out and they hit it just like every other horror movie. But in this movie, it's so much more than that. Mm. Uh, and, and I, and I, we discussed this in the mini pod, but, but the, the fact is, is that once they, once the cop comes along and she is acting a certain way towards the cop that he would never yeah. think about, doing because he knows that he would probably be put in handcuffs but she's being duplicitous is there a way to be triplicitous because she's <laughs> she's being she's being disingenuous yeah. to daniel kaluuya but she's also being disingenuous to the cop right because she's more angry and more like she more she's trying to make it seem like uh she's like uh, a white girl who's like out to protect black guys yeah. uh, rights and everything i'm liberal get you know i'm I, this is for my man here but meanwhile she's also for herself she's kind of like she that's been discussed that the reason why she's like this is because she doesn't want a record of this right. happening uh, so that if anybody does ask where this guy went there's no record of him being on this road anywhere near that house all that and uh and so i i i think there's a lot being said in that scene uh she she's super she's super shady we don't know that right off the bat mm -hmm. uh he he just wants to get out of the situation yeah get out uh and uh and uh and it's just all this it's this whole thing where we it sets up the entire thing for me um and then and yeah. then even deer become like somewhat symbolically oh, important yeah. mm -hmm. later and that, on and that noise is so fucking unsettling too oh, mm -hmm. that, yeah. yeah uh so okay she's putting on a show for the the chris character right yeah to make sure that she he trusts her because she's standing up for him yes as a member of the the white race it's basically. no different than bradley whitford saying i would have voted for obama on a third term yeah, only yeah. she's more self-aware about it. yeah 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 it's exactly the same thing so she's accomplishing that gaining his or continue to gain his trust and then leaving that paper trail i wonder what would have happened yeah the cop isn't in on it i don't think no i wonder what would have happened had he given her that ticket yeah had i mean i think the only issue there is that if if you have Lil Rel calling about uh, his friend, then they could have a record somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they've he, got his license, right? They've got yeah, his yeah. license and everything like that. And he was seen on this road at this time. And then they could figure out where the family is mm -hmm. and all that. So I think that's what it comes down to is that the reason why she's being that way is that, yeah, we want to make sure there's no trace of him um after this and and so yeah it's uh it's a scene that i'm trying to think if you take it out it's probably still the same it just uh, it loses it definitely loses a little bit of but it uh, loses con yeah it loses a lot of context to it um and it loses you you realize how 
how deeply into character she is mm-hmm. this whole this whole time because she makes it look very convincing that she's this liberal chick that she's like you don't have to see his driver's license you're just doing this because he's black and all that and meanwhile she's in the back of her mind she's like god i hope he doesn't take this license because yep. you know this could be an issue later um so yeah there i you like go. it yeah cool. i'm trying I, I don't know what else could be though what else the only other one that would that popped into my head was was the obvious one was the lakeith stanfield uh roll credits thing. yeah because that it's so there's there's this meme going around or a gif going around saying i guess it's a meme uh saying antonio brown meeting josh gordon at uh, patriots camp and josh gordon is the lakeith stanfield character and he's like oh hello <laughs> and antonio brown gives him the fist bump yeah. and he grabs it and shakes yeah, it yeah yeah because he's been indoctrinated yeah to the oh, Patriots. it makes what? total sense and jordan peele actually came on and said you win yeah <laughs> totally makes sense totally makes sense but i mean that's that's a whole it not only is it the the roll credits moment but it's 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 where everything turns on its head because you know shit's been going down Mm -hmm. but you just don't know how it's been going down yeah and uh i love that scene but i love the scene that you're talking about too Mm -hmm. that uh, especially seeing it in theaters that the noise that the deer makes is so well and and when you when you watch it the first time it does it seems like a totally innocuous scene Mm -hmm. uh and that's sort of what i've been like uh gravitating towards on this topic is something that seems a little innocuous but then when you go back and think about it, it really sort of says a lot about the movie on the whole. Mm-hmm. And uh, and so, yeah, uh, that's something that I'm, I'm, I want to watch it again and, and really, really peer into that scene and see if there's even more stuff I can yeah. come out of. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Unbreakable. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I've probably seen this movie 20 times. Mm-hmm. I love it. When we, when, whenever this topic comes up, I tend to try and look for movies that I have seen a ton, and hopefully you guys have seen a bunch too, um, <clears throat> as opposed to picking something like John Wick 3, the heart, the heart of John Wick 3, and then half the <laughs> listeners haven't mm-hmm. even seen it. Mm-hmm. Um, I really think the heart of Unbreakable is that, that near last scene in the morning where mom's making breakfast. And he slowly slides the newspaper about the heroism in front of his kid's eye. And his <laughs> kid starts tearing up. Uh, he accepted his role as a hero the night before mm. by going out and doing all those. But I don't think he's fully embraced it until he tells his kid. Because his kid's been a part of this journey almost the whole way. Because mm-hmm. um, <clears throat> he comes out of, I think it was a memorial service or something, and finds that card on his windshield. Mm-hmm. And then he takes his son to the comic shop to meet Elijah for the first time. Mm-hmm. Um, and his son is there with the weightlifting scene. His son tries to shoot him. Fucking his kid, <laughs> his kid thinks he's a superhero before he does. So admitting to his kid that he now thinks that is sort of like tying off the bow on the whole arc of that character. Mm-hmm. I don't even want to act like glass happened. Mm-hmm. Boy, it really does take the a little bit of the shine off of that character. It really it? does. It really does. Especially since the most frustrating thing is it seems like he did nothing for 18 years. Yeah. Like he took down Mr. Glass and then he just kept being a security guard eating at diners. And yeah. then when an, and then the split beast comes along, well, I guess I better put the slicker back on. <laughs> I guess he's going after some purse snatchers. Yeah, but, no, uh, they, they said that it, he's been... Uh, yeah, uh, he's what been is he, the poncho or whatever. Yeah, he's call he's been wearing the poncho the whole time. But like, yeah, he's going after like real small time criminals and everything. And there doesn't seem to be any sort of big villain like mm. Glass going around. Even for though, another... even though the horde's been out there, he's he's kidnapped several g- girls before, mm-hmm. and he hasn't shown up. Yeah, mm-hmm. and they and uh, God, we could go into this forever. But the movie tries to make it seem like. uh you know like uh, this was this is some amazing thing that it, that's happening or whatever I, I, it's it, it feels like there should be more than just three in philadelphia that have some sort of powers yeah. and in, and if there, there should, are any <laughs> yeah if there are any and there should be like there should be way more all around the world and that's what the movie is hinting at at the end with that big you know video Ooh, youtube real. thing yeah which doesn't make sense to me either but uh but it seems like there would have been a lot more 
stuff happening in the world man in movies when shit goes viral it is instantaneous yeah. like, literally everyone in the world is watching that video right at the same time yeah that's not how and, and people works. not yeah people will be at uh at a train station waiting for their train and see something and they're like come here like it's some you know like we've got to we got to watch this now like you know i i kept thinking about like if someone showed a video like that to me, I'd be like, yeah, I'll, I'll see that later. Yeah. That seems pretty cool. Yeah. Pretty that, good effects. <laughs> yeah. It would look like viral marketing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You already can't trust video, right? Like mm -hmm. every three days now, there's some viral video with a deep fake where they take Tom Cruise and they put him in some movie he was never in, mm -hmm. like Rambo, or they put, you know what I mean? Have you seen these? I've seen one that's particularly disturbing when uh, Bill Hader is doing an interview and doing his voices like it, when he becomes tom cruise he's talking about uh tropic thunder yeah uh and he's doing the voice and it becomes he becomes tom cruise yeah and then there's one brief moment where he mentions seth rogan and they turn him into seth see rogan. we are already in an era where people can point at any piece of video and say i, I think that's doctor yeah. and cause enough doubt scary yeah, there's a uh there was something happening with the people who made who came up with deep fakes where they're coming up with software that can just figure out what deep fakes are hmm. uh so that was a thing i think they figured out early on that this is something that could be used for really nefarious things mm. and uh and so now they're they're trying to create software that makes sure you can detect them when it happens but i don't know that's going to be the premise of Face Off 2. Oh, yeah. God damn. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Deep fakes. We see you on the video. Okay, so there, I saw multiple people, including your guy from Deadspin, tweet out, they should just play the cast Nicolas Cage and John Travolta again, but swap roles. No, oh, I don't like that. I don't understand why that is even a funny idea to anyone. No. Like we've, we, That's literally the movie. Yeah. We already saw them <laughs> playing each other. Yep. We don't need to see them playing each other again mm -hmm. with the same story. Not that, <laughs> not that this fucking needs a reboot at all. No. Okay, well, it's uh, time to talk about better help today. Yeah, baby. Yeah, baby. Uh, yeah. yeah, baby. That's right. You said baby. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you got uh, a problem with my babies? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so we have, uh, Jonathan with us here today and, uh, and, and Barrett who are both been, uh, uh, going through the better help, uh, service mm -hmm. and, uh, tell us well, how everything's going. The reason that I personally started doing this is that because we make mental health such a big focus on this podcast and kind of us overall, we wouldn't want to, to steer you into a place that like we didn't think we weren't comfortable with. So I was like, this is a perfect time for me to do it. And as I said the last time, I was a bad patient for a while. I was negligent in uh, making my next appointment and stuff like that and really just slipped off. And when I got back and I finally got back with my wonderful counselor and when I got back, uh, sh I was a little bit more of a shit show than I <laughs> realized mm. I had become, mm. uh, you know, not not doing the things that uh, she had suggested at the, the beginning. And uh, we got very much back on course. She, we got into some deep, deep stuff. And I actually emailed Jeremy later on saying that this was more, a lot more challenging than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> and, uh, but I felt better afterwards. I, I felt better. I really did. Just by nature of like sharing some of the stuff that I would never talk about. Philosophy, you know, things that make me, me, things that I want to accomplish in life, things like that. Uh, not stuff that comes up in normal conversation. So I felt better and, uh, head back in now at a weekly appointment and I cannot recommend it more. I'll tell you what, the, the sessions of therapy that are challenging are the best ultimately. <laughs> and I've gotten to a point now where I can almost mid session go, I am so angry that you're right about that <laughs> and realize that I'm going to grow from this challenge. Uh, it's happened a handful of times between my therapist and I, and it, every single time he's challenged me, it has led to growth that I'm really, really glad mm -hmm. uh, came about. So I, I think that's why my reply to you was like, awesome! Yeah. That is <laughs> challenging. That's a really great feeling. You kind of, uh, it, it's it's almost like you feel better and exposed a little bit at the same time, but mm -hmm. in, in a good way. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then, and then but then sometimes, you know, it's kind of nice to you alternate those with some weeks, you know, you're just, it's it's just a casual conversation almost, you know, just what what's going on with mm -hmm. you and everything like that. And uh, sometimes even that's just, you know, very helpful. I was very leery of this. And uh, but no, this has been amazing. This has been Great. one of the best things um, I've ever 
uh, done for myself. I think it's just um, helped me be just a better version of what I can be. Um, it's helped me be a better husband, a better father. Um, although I was awesome at both of those beforehand, don't get me wrong, <laughs> but, uh, no, no, but seriously, but, and I think, I think my wife would attest that she just, she's even said to me, like, you just, you just seem, you seem happier, you seem different. And so, uh, it's been a great experience. I've really enjoyed it. Well, the, the, the practicalities of this cannot be overstated. The fact that, uh, you can do this from home, the mm-hmm. fact that they have video, they have chat, they have message boards, everything is in your counseling room in one spot could not be easier to sign up. Um, they've got over 3,000 licensed therapists, and this is very important, people. These people know what they're, they're talking about. They're all over the country. They're actually international, too, so everybody outside of the U.S., look this up and, and make sure that it's available in your, in your area. If you're dealing with depression, stress, anger, um, things like that, you, th- this is a great resource. If, if you feel like you need some help uh, with, with mental health counseling, betterhelp.com. Slash Sincast, and you get 10% off your first month. Don't let the money issue uh, deter you. Um, let them know if you've got any issues, but this is a big help. Go straight to betterhelp.com slash Sincast and go through that link right below our logo. It'll get you started, and it could not be easier. I'm th- I'm I'm very, 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 very happy that, that we are doing this, and that I am doing this, and that Jonathan is doing yeah, this, and that we're great. all part of this uh this effort to get this word out awesome awesome uh so uh recommends and warns i'm yeah. ready totes amaze balls they're great it won the academy award oh for what for best movie ever made go ahead i finally saw book smart yeah ah, what'd you think book smart oh it was fucking hilarious uh instantly one of my three favorite movies of the year i am mine too um and i think it's I think it's creatively unfair to call it a female super bad because mm-hmm. um, there's the similarities are such that it's high school kids and they're trying to get to a party. Yeah, that's and sex is on the brain, but that's pretty much it. Mm-hmm. And that's high school. Um, mm-hmm. This is shot better than I expected mm-hmm. um, because and now I may need to go watch super bad again, but I don't remember coming away from that movie going what cinematography <laughs> but there's a scene in here where uh caitlin deaver jumps in the pool at the party at the end yeah and it's a fantastic scene anyway because she's finally one of the cool kids mm-hmm. the girl she likes she thinks likes her back she's gonna near skinny dip in the pool at the coolest party in the world and all these people in the pool having fun and then she comes up on the other end of the pool and sees the terrible things that she sees and the swim back is like the reverse of that emotionally. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it's shot really like dreamlike. Mm-hmm. Uh, I loved it. I thought they're both great. They're both going places. I, I think Caitlin Deaver, I was right like a year ago whenever I said she was a star to watch. Like she's got some spark, some kind of. She does. What was she in before that you were talking about? Um, Some movie where her boyfriend died, but the guy who killed him tries to fall in love with her hmm and then of course she's on that tim allen sitcom um, is she really well she's not any she's a recurring character now but the uh, last man standing she oh. played with one of his daughters okay. she's also in front runner she plays one of gary hart's daughters oh in, really in that movie um but there's something about this the snark sarcasm the the wit mm-hmm. of this movie that she not everybody can pull that off and beanie feldstein does is it feldstein uh-huh. mm-hmm. she does too um <laughs> Funniest single closed caption moment of my life is in this movie. <clears throat> what is it? And now I've been watching captions for about seven years. That's about when I found out I was going deaf. And they're in the car in the principal's Uber with all the <laughs> chili pepper lights. <laughs> and they're watching the lesbian video because she doesn't even know how to sex. <laughs> and it's plugged into his car. And he says, oh, if you guys are having trouble hearing it, boom, turns on the audio. <laughs> and it's basically like lesbian porn orgasm sounds. <laughs> but the closed caption says rapid squelching. <laughs> 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 I had to Google it to make sure squelching wasn't Squ- a bad word. <laughs> It's like the sound that, that 
<laughs> Similar to when your shoe comes out of the mud is what oh, squ- oh, squelch God. is. And so, somebody oh, writing these fuck. captions, I think, went to great lengths to entertain me yes. by looking for the perfect humorous word. I could hear the noises because I'm not 100% deaf, but rapid squelching is the funniest <laughs> subtitle I've ever seen in my whole goddamn life. Uh, Caitlin Dever is also a beautiful boy, and the movie that you're talking about might be All Summer's End. That it's is. got Ty Sheridan in yep. it. Yep. Yep. Um, but it's okay. It's not great, but yeah. she's good in it. Um, no, I loved Booksmart. Um, I'm so glad. I, I really, really love that movie. Yeah, there's a l- there's a lot to like. Mm-hmm. I think even that friendship plays more sincere. There's heart. There's more heart here than there was in Superbad, and I think mm. that's why the friendship played a little more sincere to me. Um, uh, but yeah, no, I loved it. I loved everything about it. It's, I love all the I love all the parties they went to that were bad. Mm-hmm. That karaoke scene, I was crying. Oh my yeah. god, it's the greatest! Literally swallows the mic <laughs> on the go down on you in a th- <laughs> <theater line. laughs> yeah, and then yeah. he yells at that guy that he's angry at, like you, sh- you ought to know, Alan or whatever. <laughs> the guy's name is. Oh my god! But uh, there's also uh, the you heard the Beanie, Beanie Feldstein is going to be in some 20 year Richard Linklater project, right? Yeah. Oh yeah, I read that. The, what I had read, read that she's going to play Monica Lewinsky in the next American Crime Story. Mm. But yeah, I did read that to 20. He's going to be like 70 something yeah. when that's done. Yeah. I mean, it's ambitious. That's mm-hmm. what I mean. I liked. The, the last one he did that was like 10 years. Mm-hmm. Uh, Boyhood. I'll mm-hmm. go for it. Mm-hmm. Uh, is uh, Ethan Hawke going to be in here? He figures yeah, he's got to be in there somewhere, right? He's probably in there. Uh, I would think it's so. It's like a good luck charm for yeah, Linkletter. I think I so. i got to watch Booksmart again. Billy Lord is so fucking great in that. The, the girl that keeps popping up <laughs> Gigi. Yeah. 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 God damn. How in the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good call. That movie should have done way better, by the way. Mm-hmm. Uh, at the beginning of that Sift Pop uh, Summer Sum Game thing that Aaron does every every year, I put it in the like honorable mentions because I thought for sure it would do like you know yeah i thought the way that people were reacting to the trailer and everything i thought it would be a, I, I didn't think it would be super bad size hit but i thought it would be mm-hmm. somewhere up there like 100 million maybe or something yeah yeah, yeah. And, you know olivia wilde put together a package of her her directing and a script and a producing partner this is like a week or two ago and eight different studio companies a bit on it like mm. she went from book smart to we all want to do whatever your next movie is. Good. So hmm. even if it didn't make money, I feel like the people in the right positions recognize the talent level there. And, uh, you know, maybe then maybe it'll find its voice on home video like so many other movies. I maybe, think it will. Maybe in two years we'll be looking at Booksmart 2. Look, if Je- <laughs> look, if Jennifer's body is getting all this yeah. like extra like love 12 years from its, you know, uh, release, this movie I think should. it's just... Maybe that's just a cultural pendulum. We like because I, because Kirsten Dunst gave an interview or gave a talk a week or so ago where she was talking about how weird her career has been and mm-hmm. how she was like, you know, we came out with, um, what's the beauty pageant one? Drop Dead Gorgeous, mm-hmm. and it got panned. Yeah. But now y'all love it. Yeah. We came out with um, Marie Antoinette, and it got panned. But now y'all love it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> she's yeah. not wrong. She's not yeah. wrong. She came off, I think, probably a little bitter in that interview, but she's totally right. She's not wrong at all. Yeah. I mean, a lot of her, even Dick, it get, nobody yeah. watched that movie when it came out. But if you bring it up today, people are like, oh, I love Dick. But, was you that know, 99, too? What, Dick? Yeah. yeah. 2000. It was when we were at Hollywood. Oh, uh, so, yeah, it would have been either 99 or 2000. Yeah, I think it's 99. So she had three 1999 movies? I think so. Jesus. Yeah. She was um, busy. Oh yeah. Hey, you know though, uh you've got to you've also got to take things. I mean, yeah, it's a different generation of people finding a movie and not having any expectations with it and everything and finding uh finding value in movies that they that back then the people who were geared it was geared towards, they didn't they didn't find it that good or whatever, but you also got to understand for your career that you that a lot of things that you get to do that you love wouldn't have you wouldn't have happened had you not done those mm-hmm. d- the those things your your life would be completely different think if marie antoinette was a huge hit now what maybe you don't even meet your husband yeah <laughs> you know maybe you're not in fargo season yeah. three yeah. or as <laughs> or, or, or as chris klein says in the election after they go through all those hypotheticals or maybe i'd be dead <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> so a couple years ago, I probably I recommended uh, Sorcerer with William Friedkin, and I watched. Oh, I want to uh, see this so that. bad. Yeah, Sorcerer is great. It uh, it's a remake of a movie called The Wages of Fear, which mm. I saw. Ooh. Uh, Wages of Fear came out in 1953. It's Henri Georges Glouzeau, mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's got the same kind of setup. Uh, only it, it it decides for about 30 to 40 minutes to do more character development and uh, and uh, and sort of it's what kind of world these people live in and everything. Where sorcerer sort of like kind of like brought three or four people from different ends of the earth into this one spot mm. and they just so happen to need money and then this oh yeah let's let's uh port nitroglycerin uh <laughs> through this through this one area and it, it's that's essentially the same story here in the wages of fear although it there's something a little bit more sinister going on here i think because this town depends on this oil company that is out there it's an american oil company mm. uh the, and uh, obviously the americans are like having like the best time of their lives they've they got everything set up in their own way they don't have to live in this shitty town but the <laughs> shitty town depends on them uh there's hardly anybody everybody's looking for work everybody's poor the it, the movie does a really good job of like of saying yeah this place is kind of a dump man mm. it's kind of a terrible place to live there's a part at the very beginning where there's this kid playing like stringing together all these like cockroaches or something like Yeek. that and he's like playing with them and then you see somebody come by selling uh like uh like ices and stuff like that they're selling ices and everything when the kid the kid looks up and he's like oh there's somebody selling these ices he turns around and there's this big huge buzzard like just who has just landed near where yeah, he yeah. was and everything and it's just already there's this sense of you're in a place of death and you're in a place of huh. like squalor and poor and everything and um and so these people are always trying to find uh, some sort of job uh the the main crux of it is that there is a, a an oil well that that uh blows up or something it's like all this fire and everything the only way to to stop the the uh the fire is to blow up go down to another rig a certain rig far away 300 miles away and uh, blow that up with nitroglycerin so that they can stop the fires and everything uh, i don't know what the science is behind that mm. but that's the exact story of sorcerer where they had to go through this one thing and they had to blow up this one oil well i guess that's the only way to do it uh, you can't do it with regular water or dirt right. or anything like that um so yeah they set this up where once again yeah it's this these they they uh this one american guy who works for the oil company tries out a whole bunch of people to be drivers and they're going to get two thousand dollars for their job but it's a hugely dangerous they have to mm. they have to port nitroglycerin which of course they do the die hard with a vengeance thing and they're well before die hard with a vengeance obviously uh, where like they show what one drop of nitro nitroglycerin does and it's oh. like <laughs> big huge you know explosion and everything so now they're carrying huge like jugs of this stuff on the back of their trucks and everything and they have to go over this terrain that is you have you have to like decide whether i'm going to go super slow over this and take forever or do i go a certain speed that's just fast enough that it won't that there won't be enough vibration or anything like that uh. and then there's like other spots where they have to like get their get their truck in just cert such a certain position to to make it to this one road and there's all sorts of obstacles with that and so, mm -hmm. and uh and so like it's it's this big you know uh great adventure film both of them are fantastic i would say the wages of fear has way more like uh gravitas i guess mm. as far as what they're going for like in sorcerer it just felt like it was yeah we're doing this for the money we need the money uh in this one there seems to be a lot on the line like they're they're willing to put their lives on the line because everything else is so horrible mm. where they're at uh i mean they don't make it seem like it's so horrible like they're sitting out there drinking they're like just hanging out and all mm. that but it's still not a great place to be and you can tell like they even have a whole scene where the guy's like uh explaining to one of the other people is like okay uh there's nothing but desert for miles you can't you can't get out of here uh, trying to go to another town, try to get an airplane ticket. It's too expensive. Um, 
just all all the jobs they they he goes and shows this one building that they were building and they stopped midway through hmm. and they said yeah they just they just stopped on this as just, just i guess the heat got to them or something i don't know so they're in a place where it's very hard to escape so it makes sense that they would do all this put their lives on the line for two thousand hmm. dollars and uh and so yeah there's always this constant like even the slightest nudge the slightest wrong thing they do in their truck could blow them up completely and uh so that's what adds to all this tension to everything mm. and there's there's three major obstacles that they go through in this thing and it's just it's just a it's a great film great what year was it 1953 not everything in here reacts well to bullets <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so that's two versions of that movie with titles that sound more like horror movies than what the movie actually is about. <laughs> yeah the wages of fear i mean that one makes more sense because in this case and they even they don't say it very like uh roll credits like it's a completely different way of saying it he says they're paying you to be frightened essentially that's a that's essentially what we're getting paid for your the wages are the you know not only the money that you're getting to be scared but it's also the cost mm -hmm. of what you're going through yeah. as well and um and uh and i think you might like wages of fear more than sorcerer uh just because of claire danes is in it because claire danes and Kristen stewart are in it. <laughs> but no um but i think uh the wages of fear is uh is a movie that uh I think you would enjoy it, and I can't really explain why. There's a certain aspect to it that I think that you would uh, really dig. Okay, Sorcerer, uh, I think, is higher tension. I oh, think, yeah. I think it's higher Movie's tension. Tense as fuck. Yeah, uh, because there's movies have have evolved so much in the 20, I think it's, you know, 24 years since this movie had come out. You know, Freakin' really shoots this very tense and you were feeling it every time that they're out like mm. every when they're on the truck you're like that that could be a time that it blows up yeah. that could be a time that blows up whereas in the wages of fear you're really going through these three set pieces everything else is kind of like yeah they're kind of having a ride <laughs> yeah yeah whereas in sorcerer it just really does feel like at any minute, every little could, bump every yeah, yeah any minute it could happen yeah. so um you remember when you were talking about Jeremy, uh, there will be blood, and there were you. You were saying like you kind of him and hawed your way through discussions because you hadn't really watched it all the way through. Yes, um, and you kind of just kind of faked your way through it. I have a, a firefly-sized fakeness in me. I've never seen the show, but you've seen the movie. I have. I'll tell you what, the movie's just the show boiled down to a movie. Well, I want to talk to you about that, but it was two thousand five. Uh, when the movie came out, it was 2005 when I saw the movie. It was on demand, but the problem was I watched it after I returned home from our colleague Jonathan's bachelor party. And so it was about three o'clock in the morning. Um, I was still up, but not in really any shape to consume a movie and try to like get into the world building aspects. And so, but I was like, uh, my wife was gone to Jonathan's future wife's uh, bachelorette party so i was like i got the place to myself i'm gonna watch uh serenity mm -hmm. and i fell asleep halfway through so i i may have actually watched the entire thing but i wasn't really processing it okay so i watched it again because i've heard everybody say you've seen firefly right yeah the show the show yeah i've seen the movie i think i saw the i'm trying to think, think if i saw the movie first then saw the tv show because back in 2005 you couldn't just i want to see firefly and it you know it magically appears like it does these days yes uh but they did play it on fx yeah or something yeah they played the whole series and i watched it but i don't i'm not i'm not deeply rooted into that show enough to like know oh that episode or this episode but you know the movie pretty well or, you're, or you've you've no, seen the movie i'm i'm, I'm not yeah, I, I I've seen it, but I don't remember much about it. Are you a Firefly fan? I've seen the show twice through. Uh, I've seen the movie probably four or five times. Okay, huh? I loved the movie. Uh, yeah, I'll okay. say that. Good enough. I had no real. The only thing I knew about this is that it is the stars basically, mm -hmm. and I knew that uh, Nathan Fillion uh, was really good, and that it was it was styled as a western mm -hmm. or like kind of a noirish western. Was not prepared for the dialogue though to be as folksy 
and and uh, westernish as yeah. it was. Yeah. And so that kind of caught me off guard. And the characterizations caught me off guard. What they actually do, they're pirates basically. Yeah. Or they're they're smugglers. Smugglers, they're con men. Yeah. Uh but Nathan Fillion really is like a hard ass captain. Like he'll he'll take some people out uh and if they're not playing by the rules, they're off his boat. That kind of thing. And I was kind of mesmerized by this movie. This movie's really really good. I think yeah, I would give it a B plus, A minus, maybe. Relative to the show, or is it? It is. It basically takes three episodes of the show and re mashes them together into one event uh -huh. and tells a bigger budget, slicker looking version of that. So for me, part of the problem with Serenity was a lot of it was retread. I see. So there's a whole episode of Firefly. What do they call? The guy who's after him t to to kill the girl and ends up fighting with Nathan Fillion a couple different oh, times. Oh, it's uh, it's uh, uh, it she will tell Edgy for the operative, the operative. So yeah. there's a whole episode of Firefly where there's an operative and they're like pursuing them, and then he even goes on a spacewalk and infiltrates their ship trying to come after the girl. Mm -hmm. um, there's uh, an episode very like the, very much like the opening scene in the movie. It's so a lot of it felt like. Uh, it works better for non-fans than it does for fans gotcha. of the show. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And for fans of the show, it was more of a what could have been. I see. Um, everyone's great, but it's Nathan Fillion that carries the, the show and the movie. He's so fucking charming. He is, but Joss Whedon's dialogue is yeah. so great. Yeah. And and all the supporting players are really... Summer Glau is is nice in her role. Adam Baldwin is hilarious. Chibolte is really good, too. That was probably really the first is. thing I'd ever seen him in. Yeah, I know. I was surprised that he was in this. Yeah. Uh, but Mrs. Deadpool, uh, Baccarat. Baccarat. Yeah, Marina Baccarat. <laughs> Marina <Deadpool>. Baccarat. <laughs> Um, Baccarin. <laughs> yes, and uh, of course Alan Tudyk uh, is great in this. And then Jewel State, yeah, yeah she's the mechanic. She's, she's really Kaylee. Funny. Well, and Jewel State has the line of the movie. This is the one thing that I do remember yeah. is that when she says, "I haven't had anything twixt my nether since it, that wasn't hooked up with batteries." Yeah, <laughs> the follow up to that is great, by the way, because mm -hmm. Nathan Fillion's like, "I don't need to hear anything more about that." And then Adam Baldwin's like. Well, maybe a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> Adam Baldwin's really funny. Um, he has he has really good mo. There's a whole episode. I would encourage you to watch the show. I, I, yeah, this has encouraged um, me to watch it. It's it's going to be a lower budget, but it works better as a long term show. There's this one episode where they end up on this planet on a smuggling run, and Jane, Adam Baldwin's character, has been there before, mm -hmm. and they they have statues to him and they have a song to him the man they call jane and he saved the day even though he's a fucking scoundrel he's the biggest scoundrel in the whole crew and he's super uncomfortable with it because as i remember he didn't know they went on to worship him and gave him credit for some save the day thing it's only like 12 episodes yeah yeah yeah. no uh, i i mean this is this has a very buffy the vampire slayer vibe which makes a lot of sense yeah uh pre-avengers joss whedon where he really had that witty dialogue that wasn't stilted like it became later on yeah you know? yeah yeah this is this is a huge recommend i'm fine I, i'm glad i finally got into it uh yeah it took a it took a while no it's great i think we did an outtake with in independence day with adam baldwin doing that uh, jane song <laughs> <laughs> and i didn't know what it was yeah. but but you were like oh yeah everybody in firefly who likes firefly is gonna love this yeah and there's a uh, there's a couple of like sudden's uh sudden david crumholtz i don't know if he's in the show as he's, the universal no, guy mr universe uh and then uh, sudden sarah paulson in there for like a minute as a hologram oh fuck she's on the planet that uh, that gets kind of yeah. oh yeah okay yeah 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 but now you know having seen it you know what i was talking about in we did a sin in a recent movie where i said this is just like in serenity when the girl was kicking ass in it the was bar. alita Alita. Yeah, yeah. it so was exactly you, right? like the Summer yeah. Glau scene where she just throws off her duster and just like starts Start fucking people up. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> no, that movie's awesome. All right. Do you have another one? Uh, I have a Warren. Oh, bring it. Uh, can you ever forgive me? Oh, Warren? Have you seen it? No. Uh, Melissa McCarthy and uh, tall British guy? Um, yes, whose name is not Alan. Um <laughs> Because I tried Googling him thinking his name was an Allen, but it's not. What, Richard E. Grant? Richard E. Grant. Yes. It's not Allen. Although, it may be Richard E. Allen Grant. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I don't think the movie is made poorly. Okay. 
And Melissa McCarthy is great. Mm -hmm. She gives a good performance, and it's super subdued. This is there's barely any comedy here at all outside of what you would see in a normal drama. This is more of a Diane Weist kind of a movie than a Melissa McCarthy movie. So I applaud not only her trying to stretch, but I think succeeding. Hmm. The problem I have for the movie is that she's a big, self-loathing, selfish jerk. Mm -hmm. And she wins. What is this movie about? I so don't think I've ever had this a true story. explained to me. Uh -huh. She's a biographer. Um, and she's working on a biography of Fanny Bryce right now. She's had, she says to her agent at one point, get me, get me an advance, get me a $10,000 advance. And she's like, can't, I can't do that. She's like, I had a book on the New York times bestseller list. That should count for something. Uh, and she's jealous of who's the, who's the, it's, uh, Tom Clancy. Uh, she's oh, jealous yeah. of Tom because he just got a $3 million advance to write a book or something. Is that Ben Falcone playing that, playing that role? Oh, I don't think he's in the, um, Tom Clancy is in it. No, Ben Ben Falcone plays a guy named Alan Schmidt. Is that the Tom Clancy that you're talking about? No, or is it just Tom Clancy? She literally says Tom Clancy. Oh, references okay. Tom I thought Clancy. I thought you were saying the Tom Clancy. Like oh no, no, she's, she's jealous. She wants, but she's also running out of money, mm -hmm. and she's got this letter. I can't even remember which famous person wrote this letter. Um, like somebody like fucking Hemingway or somebody wrote this letter. It's kind of boring. And she takes it to this local bookstore where antique store where she knows the owner a little bit. And uh, she eventually sells it. She gets like $700 for it. And then she kind of, a light bulb goes off. And she starts forging letters from famous people who are now dead. Mm. And then going into bookshops and selling them. There's apparently, within the movie and in real life, a very, very hot, active, tiny market for old literary knickknacks, mm. signatures, letters that Edgar Allan Poe wrote to his niece or what have you. Uh, <clears throat> and then she gets caught by one of the guys who's like, hey, I sold that one to a dealer in California. And she's like, you sell the dealers? Oh, no, I'm screwed. He's like, well, he said that his dad knew this guy who wrote this letter and that he would never have said it this way. Hmm. So I can't buy anything more from you. So she's also run into Richard E. Grant, another self-loathing, um, selfish individual, and they have coffee or beers every now and then and commiserate. They, the movie wants you to think they form some loser's friendship that matters. I'm calling bullshit on that hijinks. <laughs> so she starts using him. So she starts having him go to all these shops as a different person to sell these forged letters because nobody will buy from her anymore. Mm. And then they get on to him. In the meantime, he stays at her apartment and kills her cat. Oh, okay. That's only important because later on they're going to be friends again because okay. they're the only ones each other has in the world. Well, then the cops get on to him. Then they come after her. It's the FBI. We know you're forging all these letters. You're going to do time. How does the movie end, Barrett? She admits to everything and is resolved. And is, is, is... She writes a book about this and it becomes a New York Times bestseller. <laughs> She wins. <laughs> she wins the day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you are the first person I think I've ever heard that did not like this movie. Now I know I haven't seen a lot of people that have seen this movie, but all the reviews have been spectacular. I I think they saw a great performance that was against type from <laughs> Melissa McCarthy, and they loved it. Wow. I'm saying. Now, part of the problem is this is based on a true story. Yeah, so yeah. somebody bought the rights to this book because she really did write a book after her arrest, and it really did become a bestseller. <laughs> and a movie. <laughs> but she started from this place of petty, selfish jealousy. Uh -huh. She did crime for several years to make money, <laughs> and then we're like, well, we'll just kind of look the other way on all that because your writing is so good. We'll just make you a bestseller on your story. So fascinated about all that crime you did. That's like arresting John Gotti and then letting him write a bestseller in jail. That's just, that's, that should be, you should be done. You cheated. She wins the day. Yeah. Yeah. All right. She She's, doesn't even get uh, like jailed for this. Uh, I think she gets like slap on the wrist jail. No, that's like uh probation. I think she only ends up with really? probation and then she has to make financial restitution to everybody that she 
which she was easily able to do once she wrote another runaway bestseller. <laughs> it's uh, it's interesting, you know, the uh, IMDb and I guess the movie doesn't credit an an, an, an adaptation in the credits. So uh, uh, Lee Israel uh, is not given a credit uh, from what I can see on the IMDb. Interesting, but uh, but when I go to Wikipedia. It says her 2008 confessional autobiography, Can You Ever Forgive Me, was adapted into a 2018 film. The uh, Can You Ever Forgive Me autobiography doesn't have a hot link. So, like, it's it's almost like it's maybe it's just like some, like, two page thing. And maybe. they didn't really make, you know, they didn't make it because maybe it was just a confession that hmm. she wrote. I don't know. She died in 2014. Well, she she the title is also misleading because she doesn't. There's no, there's no penance. Like she's not mm. sorry. Um, she regrets that a girl she was flirting with doesn't want to date her anymore. She regrets getting caught. But can you ever forgive me? Is one of the things she would sign whenever she was forging a Dorothy Parker letter. Because Dorothy <laughs> Parker apparently famously said, "Can you ever forgive me, darling?" Stuff <laughs> like that. that's where that comes from. Mm. She forged so many Dorothy Parker letters. Can you ever forgive me? Became her catchphrase. Huh. But the movie's not saying she wants to be forgiven. Uh, you know, watch it at your own. I'm tell I'm, I'm giving it like it is. That's what it is. She's great. <laughs> yeah, it's a yeah. great performance. It's not a terribly long movie. Even Richard Grant is good. It's about literary forgery. If if you that's your bag, go for it. Couldn't couldn't get into. And the again, characters. I'm not saying every movie has to have a, a protagonist that is a good person, but th this movie only has like three characters mm -hmm. her agent richard grant and her and none of them are good people mm. there's no there's nothing it's just like when i watch roman j israel esquire and by the end i was like he didn't change he's still an <laughs> asshole roman j israel and lee israel were, were related that's right wow i didn't even realize i was talking about two movies with characters <laughs> named israel roman l israel <laughs> so yeah, yeah I, I was very interested to watch this i think i yeah. heard good things as well and uh maybe i'm on an island i didn't no, enjoy no, it no, i'm glad it's really met. frustrating I, she I, got I she got you. handed a victory she got a severance package from life so, for, for cheating do you not like the movie because people shouldn't be able to get away with that shit or is is the movie itself actually good you just i don't know it's that's a i guess that's a tough question it could be that the movie's good but i don't like how the real events unfolded mm -hmm. there's yeah. another movie I, I told you about not too long ago called submission um where uh Stanley Tucci is a writing professor and he yeah, sleeps yeah, with yeah. one of his students. Mm -hmm. um, and he's struggling to pitch a book. He can't come up with another book. He's had a hit book. It's been several years. Now he's a professor. He can't come up with any ideas. And his agent even says, write a memoir. <laughs> right? Everybody's doing memoirs these days. He goes on to fuck his student, get in trouble, get fired. And how does the movie end? He's writing his memoir, suggesting he's going to go off and be just fine and have another bestseller because you can turn this story into a book. <laughs> mm -hmm. howdy ha And I just, again, maybe it's because of the real world. I'm trying to say nice things. She's mm -hmm. great. Yeah, yeah. I was impressed with her act. I do think that movies tend to make heroes out of people who shouldn't be heroes. That's what I feel like this movie did. Yeah. And 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 we we lavish praise on on something that... Well, yeah, I mean, it's some some entertainment here, but there were people who actually got screwed here. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think about like the you know the Tanya Harding movie. You know, it's like mm -hmm. it's like uh, the people who who did the hard reporting about Tanya Harding back in the day was like. You made her into a hero? Are you serious yeah. right now? <laughs> yeah. I, I'm fucking disgusted yeah. by this. Yeah. You know, so anyway. Yeah, sorry. Sorry to be a downer. <laughs> That's all right. No yeah. 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 That's all right. That's all right. Uh, I don't yeah. have anything else. Oh, yeah? Yeah. I've got a quick one. Uh, I rewatched About Schmidt just recently. Yeah. Uh, have you seen this since it came out? Mm, no. Have I you? saw it once in theaters and loved it. It's been a while since I've seen it. I saw it in 2002 when it came out in the mm. theaters, and I remember loving it too, but it's been forever because I didn't want to go back to it because it's it's pretty depressing. Yeah. I mean, it's it's really Jack Nicholson's character having a breakdown and being piled shit on, but like he can't get out of his own way either. Mm -hmm. He's been used to this lifestyle living with his wife for 42 years, and she dies, 
And, you know, he's got this very autocratic, like, you know, uh, he's an actuary and everything. He likes things the way they are. And the whole family is in town uh, for the funeral. And the, the daughter, Hope Davis, uh, is sticks around for a little bit. He's like, well, this will be how things are. And then she leaves and he's by himself. And that's when he reaches out to this African ministry type of thing and starts writing. He adopts this child, sends you know, a dollar a day or something like that, the Sally Struthers type of thing. Mm -hmm. And his name is Ndugu. Ndugu. And that's when he's writing, he's the dear Ndugu. And he writes this confessional style. The funny part of the payoff for this that I had forgotten is that he's putting all kinds of crazy shit into this letter, like really pouring his heart out and like about his humanity and his growth as a character. And when he when Ndugu writes back, he's six. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's the it's the nun like in the thing writing for him. He enjoys writing your letters. He is six years old. He just had his birthday. Uh, but but it's very, very charming. It's it's Alexander Payne, probably like his most outside of maybe the descendants, like the, the, the most emotional that he's gotten. Yeah, this is the the Alexander Payne episode almost. I mean, we had Sideways talked about. Yeah. And I had a little reference to election earlier. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, this is the Alexander Payne. It is so good. It's it's better than I remembered, actually. So Ooh. we've recommended About Schmidt and mm -hmm. Serenity. Mm -hmm. We recommended Booksmart. We did. Wages of Fear. Yep. And mm -hmm. we warned Can You Ever Forgive Me. Even though apparently everybody loves it with me. <laughs> I want justice. I want yeah. justice. All right. You know what, Jeremy? We like all movies because if you can't appreciate the work that someone put into that movie, <laughs> then then you then you can't criticize them anymore. <laughs> well, nobody ever intended to make a bad movie. That's true. Except for well, except for Birdemic. <laughs> But you're, I think you're right about uh, stuff like can Can you ever forgive me? It's like if you can tell me an interesting tale, you are forgiven. You're really good. Is. I like I like your story. It really is. Like she just cheated a whole bunch of people over and over and Wolf over. Wolf of again. Wall Street mm -hmm. is a big Oh God, I watched that again yeah. recently. But I love Wolf of Wall oh, Street. Oh, I love it so much. Yeah. Well, and I I've only seen that movie once. Hmm. And I remember liking it. Oh, it I, I remember saw it also with you. calling it the most Scorsese movie I'd ever seen in yeah, my life. Yeah, it is. Yep. But yeah, he's out walking around getting paid to do dinners and Yeah, yeah. He, he talk this guy about screwed millions of people. Millions. Yeah. And uh, and uh, now he's out, you know, yeah, giving talks and stuff, and yeah. ha got a great new found. That movie fame. got sued though about they didn't give all the they didn't give enough profits to one of the people who put money in or something. Like oh, that. really? Yeah, it's been in the news lately. <laughs> I think the guy, surprising. the investor who sued them, won, and they had to pay him some 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 ducats. Mm -hmm. Some ducats. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh, let's do one question at least, and we'll see we'll see how this goes. Question. Question. I got something to say. I am listening. Have you ever had a movie that you totally loved but now can't stand? And not just on the whole, it doesn't hold up quality-wise or vice versa. I'll start. Uh, I don't know if I loved this movie, but speaking of Matthew McConaughey, Wolf of Wall Street connection. <laughs> you remember the movie Two for the Money? Yeah. <laughs> I always get this one confused with the Link one where... Lincoln Lawyer? Um, <laughs> the one where Sandra Bullock steals paintings. Oh, two of by C. Two of by C. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I was excited about this movie because it was McConaughey. Was two thousand, two thousand two, somewhere around there. Yeah, it was uh, McConaughey. Really, like you know, not at his peak. Certainly before the McConaissance and all that stuff. But it was outside of like his rom com stuff. It was Pacino still when Pacino was Pacino, mm -hmm. and it was man in the trailer. Oh, it was the sports all Pacino. betting! It was the sports betting. He can't I'm lose. A, I've inexplicably seen this like three times. Me too. And I read, <laughs> and I remember liking it. And it was it was fun. It was kinetic. But what I didn't remember is that Pacino's in this for like maybe eight minutes or something like yeah. that. But they way oversold his involvement. Yeah. And McConaughey's not good enough to hold it. It's just a bunch of glamour shots of him working out and fucking like getting on the phone and and uh here's sell my hot it. tip yeah yeah sell it. yeah oh this movie is like as light as a feather and it's awful <laughs> but i remember enjoying watching it back in the day yeah. uh, it came out in 2005 Ooh, of course the year oh, of years uh the uh this guy who did it dj caruso yeah 
uh, has done movies such as The Salton Sea, Taking Lives. Oh, yeah. Uh, Disturbia, which might be his, yeah, his one big one. Eagle Eye. Oh, I Am Shia. Number Four. And another one called Standing Up, which I'm sure Jeremy's seen. Well, he's got a better resume than I do. Anything, anytime I look at something that says, like, it's a movie that's, like, Standing Up. I've never heard of that, Jeremy's seen it. <laughs> probably. And, probably and then, uh, then there's one called The Disappointments Room. And he did Triple X, Return of Xander Cage. Oh, wow. that is delightful. DJ Caruso. Yes. There you go. So, two for the money, not... <laughs> Not not good. No. Okay. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad you finally came around. Pacino and McConaughey sounds good on paper. Mm -hmm. Somebody else in the uh, Rene, Rene Russo? Somebody, yes. Somebody Rene else Russo. In, yeah. Yes. Um, this is a difficult question because it, as phrased, I don't think I've ever all the way loved a movie and then later all the way hated it. <laughs> I have gone the other direction, mm -hmm. but I tried to look for big moves that weren't quite so extreme. So I'm not going to tweet about it, but I happened to catch Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure about a month ago. Mm -hmm. Almost nothing about this movie holds up. Like I watched this maybe 10, 15 times when I was a teenager. I loved it. This we all first quoted one. it. Yeah. Okay. We all quoted it like everybody else. Mm -hmm. It's not very funny. Yeah. I um I also saw this recently, and I agree with you. Yeah, I was very big into Bill and Ted back in the day, yeah. and watching it now, I was like, "There's only a couple of things in here that would still make me laugh and everything." I think the them deciding that they have to put the key somewhere and tell their <laughs> tell their old selves to put to to go and find it. That's pretty fun uh and there was and i can't I, I can't even remember the line that they said when they're coming in. i think it's when they get billy the kid and they bring him bring him back to the like um renaissance or whatever it is whatever time period with the castles and everything mm -hmm. right? he said alex winter says something to the effect of uh you're really uh, adapting to the weirdness of time travel or something like that to Billy. And it's a word that he uses that he shouldn't even know the name because they're so dumb. <laughs> yeah. And Don't they call him Mr. The Kid? Yeah. Oh, I think so. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> I mean, I have bigger issues mm -hmm. and that's where I got, I went wrong on Twitter because one of the first things I mentioned is there's a moment, maybe even two in Bill and Ted's where they hug each other enjoy oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. and then push off and call each other the the f slur mm -hmm. <laughs> and i'm just wondering like when they said maybe we'll do a third one and the internet internet lost its fucking jism all over the screen <laughs> and then they announced hey we're gonna actually make it and the internet like lost all its jism all over the screen it again. Off and yeah. <laughs> was had anyone recently seen it yeah, because what not. exactly are we excited about if mm. it's like this the first two movies, it's not going to be very funny. Mm. But they're also going to have to, I believe Keanu Reeves is a genuinely good human being. I don't believe he's going to hug Alex Winter in this movie and then push off and make some sort of homophobic slur. Yeah. But what, what else? There's nothing there. It's, yeah. it's a puff of air. And now we're going to make a third one and everyone's happy. And I just think everyone wants to be young again. Yeah. Everyone wants to be 20 years younger again. So when they say face off being rebooted, everybody's like, fuck it. Hey, that movie rules. <laughs> and I'm like, hey, I don't, I, I'm fine. And I don't want to be 20 again. That fucking sucks. <laughs> yeah. um, Good call. Same same era. Um, who framed Roger Rabbit? Oh Jesus! Oh. This <sighs> makes a lot of people sad when yeah, I say this. Yeah, yeah. I'm right with you. Um, I actually was in a group of people, movie loving people, uh, recently where they brought up their love of that movie, and I was like, man, I saw that recently. I don't like it, anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and it. You know, it could just be that uh, I don't know. I've I've become a sour, bitter old person. Uh, that <laughs> sour I, Bill. I yeah, exactly. <laughs> I am uh, totally, um, totally um, willing to admit that I'm I'm rotten on the inside now. <laughs> uh, but uh, but watching that one again, I was like, man, I loved this when I was a kid. <laughs> Why is this sucking so bad for yeah. me now? Why is it so bad? Oh, and I haven't seen it in forever. I, I have fond memories of it, but it had to have been something objectively just not 
good for you to to change your opinion on it. I can't put my finger on it. I just know that I wasn't having as good a time as I as I thought I would. All right. Well, when uh, we were writing Since Forward, I remember definitely thinking, this, this is bad. This mm-hmm. is, I watched this a bunch when I was younger, and I loved it. But yeah. this is just, just not funny. And I think part of it is the movie got a little too wowed by its own technology. Sure. And so a lot of the quote-unquote jokes became slapstick interactions between a cartoon and a human, which really only makes me giggle the first couple times. Right. And, and then the, just the mystery that's underlying that they gave like maybe two minutes worth of thought to the murder mystery <laughs> underlying all of this. Because, mm-hmm. again, it was technology, cartoons, and humans. Wow, look at that. Look at <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and, and Roger Rabbit himself, even though that's a, a great, like, that's, uh, was it Charles Fleischer who does yeah, the, yeah. That's a great performance. But, man, he's fucking annoying, mm-hmm. Roger Rabbit is. Mm-hmm. Like, this is so many times, it's like, God damn it. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and and a lot of times it gets frustrating too when um when when cartoons decide that they're going to be cartoons in this one spot of the movie but in any other spots they're like oh yeah I need to not be a cartoon <laughs> even though the movie is trying to tell us that they're always cartoons they always have to do those things that they do in cartoons mm-hmm. I don't know it that wasn't the reason why I didn't like it it's just that I was sitting there going I remember we're sending it going oh this is going to be one of those fun ones because yeah. I'm going to love watching the movie and I'm going to get through this like this is going to be one that takes like an afternoon to get through and then it just became a slog <laughs> and uh usually when you know you like a movie like the movie is like a, a, you've gone through an hour and you're like wow and I've written 60 things, and I'm still happy. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that dip scene uh, with the shoe was fucking traumatic for me when I was a kid. Oh, yeah, yeah, God. yeah. God, he just zips in, and he's like, ah! Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Christopher Lloyd is terrifying. Yeah. He is, especially at the end where he's, he's talking about the highway. It's going to be billboard after billboard. <laughs> My God, it'll be beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> uh okay that'll do it for this week uh keep going to syncast presented by uh cinema sins on facebook we have a soundcloud we have a discord if you want to go to facebook i can give you a link to that uh cinema sins twitter music video sins twitter there are a lot of places to come and talk about this very episode and strings is out september 24th 24th september 24th sequel to the ables brilliant book jeremy scott author Buy the book, read it. The first chapter is online at our website. Yeah, cinemasins.com slash strings. Uh, first chapter will rivet you, and trust me, the rest of the book lives up to the hype. It's awesome. Go get it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And get the Ables while you're at it, too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but that'll do it for this week. It's Chris Atkins and Jeremy Scott and Barrett Share. We'll see you next time. Thanks for listening. Comment on our episodes on our SoundCloud page. Check us out on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, and Reddit, and be sure to visit cinemasins.com. Press, 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 press. But what's the one? What's the That's other? That's the chorus one? of that song. What's brother? the other one where she's like, are they in a strip club? We did it on MBS. I'm Money. To- yeah, money's okay. Like that has its money. It's got a good beat. Remember that song? That was just work, 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 yes. work. There Which were one? two songs. Fifth Harmony. Work. There were two songs that did that. <laughs> Fifth Harmony did it, and was it Rihanna? Yeah. You gotta work, 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 work. Yeah. Oh, motherfucker, work, 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 work. Oh my work, god! Work. And they happened at the same time. Yeah, they did. <laughs> Fuck! Stop uh. with this bullshit. <laughs> you know, Rihanna hasn't put anything out in a long time. Isn't she well, coming music. out with one soon? Uh, I don't think I haven't heard it, but probably uh, she's I, been doing Fenty Beauty l- makeup stuff. I think there's so much money in that shit. That's why so many celebrities have their own fragrances and oh, it's makeup insane. lines. It's insane. What would be the uh, the cinema sense? <laughs> mm. Stale fart. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a, it's that smell in your office. When you've been writing for eight hours straight, and then you walk out and you walk back in, the smell would be <laughs> the smell would be the the orgy room two days later. Uh, You're gonna look like Tiger Woods. 
Well, no, well, maybe. <laughs> I hope I don't look like what's the <laughs> Matt Dillon from Something About Mary. <laughs> There's some one where somebody got them and they're too big. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's something about Mary. Uh, I hope that's not me. No. <laughs> that would be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you wild. what, I was awake and loopy, but it sure as hell felt like they were hammer and chiseling all my teeth and then scooping pieces yep. out with a spoon. Yeah, just did that recently. Yeah, that was fun. Sucks. But they gassed the shit out of me, man. I'm like. Because I'm the only person, apparently, that asks for gas for for these procedures. I'm like, you're taking a fucking tooth out of my head. Gas me the fuck up. Yeah. And they're like, you you really want that? I'm like, how much is it? They're like, $25. I'm like, fuck. Yes. Yeah. Throwing money well, you're at not, And you're not going to be able to. I mean, you have to have somebody drive you either way. So no, the you... gas just wears off. Oh. Yeah. The gas, you're, you're fine after like 20, 30 minutes or something like that. Yeah, that's mm. not this. The, I got a pill I have to take the night before and then two pills oh, I take the next morning. and get uh, Get a couple extra. Get a couple of extra. Yeah, yeah. going on, okay. <laughs> you yeah. know, to take the edge off. That's how you end up on sixty minutes, Barrett. Yeah, be hilarious. Like you get sick, but you're high as balls. Yeah. So you're like, this is fucking great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, it's so worth it. it. Looks You'll like, be like oh, Wolf of Wall Street. Yeah, yeah. Oh, <laughs> trying man. to drive your car. It looks like that actual Family <laughs> Guy vomit that comes out. Like, <laughs> <laughs> bro. <laughs> oh shit. Also, thanks for the the it stuff. Yeah, did you guys like that movie? No, kind of what I'm thinking. The reviews <laughs> yeah, are not strong. <laughs> it's two hours and forty minutes. Yeah. I predict. Uh, yeah, with I predict right, you're right, gonna right. hate this movie. That's so so disappointing because I love the first one so I did much. Too. I did I mean, too, with, man. Yeah, when it comes to horror movies, I don't know what you're gonna like and dislike. So, but I I don't think you'll like this. I don't think even I know yet. Just because yeah. up until about five or six years ago, I just didn't watch much horror at all. But now I'm venturing out. I agree man. with your take on Escape Room. The Escape Room is fun, but very stupid. Yeah, I have not watched it 15 <laughs> times yet. I have watched it a second time. Yeah, so it's, yeah your prediction is not off yet. Obviously, it won't be 15 yet, <laughs> but in February or March, it will be 15. <laughs> I'm, I'm not denying yeah. it. I wish it wasn't fine. I wish that I could sleep until like 9.30 or 10 o'clock, but... Um, I can't. I don't remember the last time I slept that late. Jesus, that was my jam up until about two and a half, three years ago. I, I would sleep late. till 10, 10 30. What happened? Uh, therapy. Uh, the therapist started yeah. talking about uh, mental and physical health benefits of rising earlier. Uh, and the, the fact that I get to spend more time with my wife, even if it's an hour or two here, an hour or two there. And so now I regularly go to bed by midnight. Mm -hmm. Used to be up till two, three in the morning. And, uh, you know, I got, I'm old, I'm 44. I got mm -hmm. about seven hours of sleep in me and then I'm restless and mm -hmm. I get up. But every time my therapist and I talk about that, he's like, still getting up early. And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, that's huge. That's awesome. Really? Yeah. That's so all. Awesome. you're saying it's a good thing. Yeah. I mean, ultimately, yeah. I, I, there was a time I worried about it, but I was, I didn't feel like I was like, God, I got to get back to bed. Right. It was just, it was just like, man, it, it felt like it was more awesome when I could wake up at 1030 <laughs> and like I just slept through everything, you know, and I can't do that anymore. It's it's either it's anywhere from 630 to 730 now mm -hmm. uh, all the time. Yeah, you should have a kid because I mean, you got to get up early when you have right? kids. Right. I mean, there should be a reason for this. You're already it's doing totally... half the work yeah. of raising a kid. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's pretty much it. Yeah. It's totally free. Maybe by I'll way. adopt. Yes. There you go. Just have it. We'll come over one day and like Ndugu is going to be. <laughs> yeah. He's just going to. You know, hey, guys, this is Ndugu. Adopted him the other day. <laughs> I like how you went right to the most racist adoption. No, you it's could from do. A, about Schmidt. Oh, is it? Yeah, oh, that's yeah, his yeah, name? Yeah, yeah. Oh, never dear, mind. Cut me calling it racist. Ndugu. Ndugu. Yeah. It's flipped. Awesome. Uh, so every weekend, my son wakes up at like. 6 30 7 o'clock he knows not to come in by seven o'clock until seven o'clock and he takes the dogs out and then i get bum rushed by an 11 year old and two puppies that have been in a crate for like mm -hmm. eight hours straight mm -hmm. so they're just it's just a whole fucking chaos mm -hmm. thing mm -hmm. and it's adorable so i can't say anything but sometimes it's a little annoying because i'm like god damn it it's a weekend i in the in the weekdays of course sleeps until the last possible second so he doesn't have to get up for school yeah. so we take the dogs into him and ah! wake his ass up mm -hmm. that's right and he loves it my dad used to come to my bedroom when i was a teenager and didn't want to get out of bed for school and he would first of all he would turn on the light mm -hmm. and walk away 
like, like a jerk. Mm. <laughs> and then if I wasn't out there in five minutes eating breakfast, he would come in and stand in my doorway and sing, oh, what a beautiful morning. <laughs> oh, uh, and then it was a race because he wouldn't shut up until you got up. My dad, my dad, I'll tell you what. That's such a dad thing to do. I yeah. would totally do that. It really is. You should do that. There you I go. would totally do that. Steal it. My, my it. dad always was able to, I, it was, it, it would take a couple of times every once in a while, but by the second time he'd be like, dude, you need to get up. I would be like, <laughs> okay, all right. You know, there would be those like once in a, you know, blue moon times where I wouldn't get up after the third time and then he'd have to come in and be like, shake me or whatever. I mean, to my dad's credit, I was the worst about getting out of bed. I fucking hate it. You, the worst at something? (laughs) I really dragged ass every single morning. Nice isn't in Paris. (laughs) Purple is a fruit. <laughs> Wait, Nice is in France, right? Yes. So we're going to Paris. That's Italy. Then we're going to. Well, it's right next to Italy. Then we're going to to by train to Nice. (laughs) Ah, by train. Then we're coming. Watch out for those horror movie people on the train, (laughs) (laughs) like in Hostel Two, or or Train to Busan, or 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 Fred Armisen in Road in in Euro Trip. (laughs) Oh yeah. No, that'll be fun. I want to. I want to do like a an actual European train ride. Where That's awesome. It's got like a, a dining car and a bar car and a sleep car. That's sweet. I don't know if we. Do they have a fuck car? Every mm. car is a fuck yeah, car. That's right. Do they have a ball it's, pit? The bar is a fuck car. It's like the devil's advocate, where he's like Kevin comes up and he's like, "This is it," and she's she's like, "Yeah." He's like, "Well, where does he sleep?" And she's like, who says he sleeps? And then he's like, well, where does he fuck? <laughs> and, and now Pacino's like, everywhere! <laughs> you like that movie way too much. Uh, no. He shows up in like silk pajamas. You can't, you can't love Devil's Advocate too much. <laughs> it's impossible. That's, All right. I, you may like it more than I do. But I really, really like. <laughs> I swear to God, I talked it's to that one signed of the, photo. It's one of the trashiest, greatest movies ever. <laughs> it is. Oh, it's so good. It may, none of it should. None of it should work at all. No. Like on paper, none of it. <laughs> and to Jeremy, it doesn't. But <laughs> but it's one of those that I couldn't help but watch. That was. I a, get it. I see what you guys love about it. No, I that just... was a movie that I. I that was another break time movie when i was at williamson square eight i would go in there and watch an hour of that thing yeah. of course part of it is connie nielsen you know is uh, at the end and everything <laughs> but a lot of it was just all the just insanity yep daddy bazoon yeah. daddy bazoon <laughs> um, also i've only seen it like three times whereas you guys have like mcgrubert it when's the point. last time you saw it oh truthfully you're gonna hit me back on this probably Eight years, nine years. I, I wonder if you gave it another chance. Well, we probably like ruined it for you from quoting it, but like, I wonder if you gave it another chance if you would enjoy yourself. I'll tell you what, if I imbibed <laughs> a little and then gave it another chance, oh, I'd probably love the shit. Absolutely, out of it. you should. Yeah, <laughs> yes. that's probably how I should go about it. Yeah, no, yeah. I would say give this myself is, a cushion. I mean, this is a movie that you could totally watch sober and feel drunk, but you could also watch it a little bit tipsy and unlike that with City Hall. Oh yeah, now City Hall, yeah. You- Oh, is that the one with Cusack and uh, yeah. Pacino? Yeah. yeah. And Bridget. There was a palace that was the city. <laughs> uh, that movie kind of sucked, didn't it? it no, sucked. it wasn't very good. Yeah. It sucked. That's a it weird just yeah, actually I, I actually it's had that whole sucked. thing in the trailer memorized where he's like, you know, there was a palace that was the city. A palace in which there were no kings, no queens. <laughs>